Today's guest is Jennifer Richmond. Jennifer is a moral courage mentor, the founder of The Truth in Between and Substack, and the Hold My Drink podcast. We begin with some of the backstory behind the widely publicized hacking of Stratfor, but the lion's share of the podcast is a discussion of many China-related topics, dating from the end of the Second World War to the beginning of what I refer to as Cold War II and beyond. So, without further preamble, I hope you enjoy getting to know Jennifer Richmond. <laughs> well, hello everybody, and thank you for joining. This is the second episode of the Arsenic Show. Today, I have with me Jennifer Richmond. Hi there. Hi, how are you? Well, I'm great, thank well, you. Thank you for coming all the way down. Yeah, uh, yeah all the way down. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am really excited to have you here. Um, you are actually one of my favorites, which is why you're number two, and Raymond only gets to do it because he was, you know, this is his studio, so uh, that that's high praise. Oh, thank you. Um, so uh, the reason I wanted to talk to you today is largely about China, yeah. um, which is, I think, on a lot of Americans' minds these days. Mm -hmm. Um, but I wanted to start before we get there. I want to talk a little bit about um, your history with Stratfor okay. um, and in particular kind of how we met and kind of give a little backstory there because I think that's a, kind of an interesting yeah. sort of lead into kind of a lot of things that are going on here. <laughs> so so uh, why don't you first start with uh, like what you were doing at Stratfor when we first met and okay. kind of what you remember because okay. I, because I, I, I'm, I'm a little shaky on how we first met. I think it might have been a Rotary Club. I was or something. gonna say it I actually think, wasn't at Stratfor. Yeah, I think it, it was just a happenstance yeah, Rotary, yeah. and then we happened to find out that we were, you know, in the same kind of space, if you would. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so I, I was working with, uh, with Stratfor, doing all their China work, mm -hmm. and from there I went on and was their vice president of international projects. So I was dealing with all of still remaining focused on china because that's my specialty so mm -hmm. i speak chinese you know my background is in china but running all of our other networks across the world mm -hmm. and so we had already met but where our relationship got very tight was at a, when we strap four was hacked yes yes and you were my friend. <laughs> Speaking of first calls, I mean, I think it was Christmas Eve. It was Robert, Christmas Eve. And I was like, holy crap. <laughs> uh, on Christmas Eve, yeah, that was a very interesting Christmas uh, to which you responded, you know, immediately to something that we weren't prepared for. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, my recollection of that was I got a call on Christmas Eve, uh, and I don't think uh, my now ex-wife at the time was particularly pleased with, but, uh, <laughs> you know, business uh, business first in some regards. Um, I, that's probably why we're not married anymore. <laughs> I can relate to that, by the way. <laughs> uh, but uh, that was an interesting hack in multiple ways. First of all, uh, it was an offshoot of Anonymous that hacked you. It was... Right. Uh, Right. Um, Lulsec, I believe, if memory serves. It was an offshoot of Anonymous. Uh, Julian Assange was also a part of that. Well, as I recall as mm -hmm. well, it's been a few years. Mm -hmm. It was an offshoot of Anonymous, and they sold the information mm -hmm. to Julian Assange. So it, it became part of the whole WikiLeaks mm -hmm. phenomenon as well. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and one of my favorite parts about that is uh, the primary guy who's in charge of that group sabu uh at one point he messaged me online because i didn't know this yeah he uh he found out that i was involved in the forensics aftermath and uh he shot me a message and said hey uh arsenic uh you know uh are, what are you gonna cut me in on this because you know I, I got you that job effectively and i said sure yeah man just give me your address and i'll uh <laughs> it turns out later he was an fbi informant uh <laughs> which is even better uh I did not know that backstory. Yes, yeah, mm -hmm, yeah. There's a lot more going on that meets the eye. <clears throat> so, one of the reasons I think that that was an interesting series of events is Stratfor, and I'll, we'll talk a little bit more okay. what they are. But Stratfor, um, call them a geopolitical intelligence company, privatized uh, geopolitical right. intelligence company, and it was led by George Freeman. And yep. he wrote a couple of very interesting books, uh, The Next Hundred Years and The Next Decade. Mm -hmm. Both of those books I thought were very fascinating, very well written. I really no problem with the content itself, except for the fact that it seemed to be lacking one very important thing, which was cyber. Completely, completely not in the book at all, or either books. 
Maybe that's why we were hacked. I suspect so. I suspect that is exactly why. Really? Um, I mean, yeah. I, I was kind of said that tongue in cheek, but you really think so. I, think, yeah. I really think so. Uh, because if he had been more focused on that, I think he would have been more focused on what are we doing about that. Right. And I, I just don't think that, that it ended up happening. I don't think it percolated through yeah. the, the company the way other aspects of security might have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, so anyway, that's a interesting backstory about how we got here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I think, uh, and you just, you know, I just learned some new things too. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, let's talk about a little bit about what strive for is, um, okay. because I think there's a lot of misnomers, especially amongst the security. There's a lot of paranoia about what the company is. There's a lot of misconceptions, but I would like to hear from your mouth. What, what do you think it is? And, and what it, what was your day to day sort of job working with them? Okay, so keep in mind I haven't been at Strat Four for oh gosh, maybe six plus years, mm -hmm. maybe even a little bit longer. Uh, Strat Four, so geopolitical intelligence. This moniker got us in a lot of trouble. I bet it did. <laughs> I have many stories of where that moniker got me in trouble. In China specifically, where mm -hmm. I was uh, stopped at many times, got mm -hmm. to be got to be even friendly with some of the Ministry of State Security. Really? Yes, yes, yes. Um, those are stories I'm happy to share. I but would, I, I would I, love I, to I, hear that. <laughs> whatever you feel comfortable sharing. I'm feeling that you might want to go a different direction. No, but... I, I I don't mind hearing whatever you got to say. So the well, I'll go back to the word intelligence. So there was an aspect, of course, of intelligence. You know, one of the things that I did is we had. Um, sources all over the world. They were sources that were in plain sight, you know, operating as academics. And really, it was a very, they all knew that they were speaking to Stratfor. So this was not some, um, you know, government undercover operation. But one of the things that we did was, I mean, where we thought that sometimes the government misinformation was the government is obviously focused on government to government mm -hmm. relationships. And so sometimes some of the best conversations were what was happening when I was taking a, a, a taxi ride. Right. Sure. So when I would be in China and to see um, how economic policy and government policy was actually affecting the real people was a lot of what the intelligence was. Mm -hmm. So again, when we use the word intelligence, people are thinking cloak and dagger. They're thinking, you know, spy pins. And that was not what Stratfor was about. But what it was about, the intelligence of Stratfor was really taking that information, even as little as like what a taxi driver would say in response to economic policy mm -hmm. and putting that through this framework of geopolitics. And so that's what made Stratfor unique because a lot of intelligence does not take into account geopolitics, which we felt at Stratfor really was a very useful explanatory tool for how the world is operating. One of the things though that you already said was in the geopolitics framework, I don't know if Stratfor has changed this now. Again, sure. it's been several years, but cyber wasn't one of our biggest mm. focus. No. Uh, now we did have people who did look at cyber, but that wasn't part of the larger overarching model that could actually change geopolitics. Mm. The thing with geopolitics is it doesn't really change that much, right? A lot of geopolitics is focused on geography and the constraints within you know, geography of various countries. And we can get into that a little bit more as we speak about China. But there are a few things that actually change geopolitical outlooks, and they're usually large events, war, you know, natural catastrophe. But cyber wasn't really part of that framework. And I think that cyber is something that actively changes geopolitics. So whether or not they've incorporated that into their framework now, hard to say, but as we already noted, it wasn't in the framework when I was there and it particularly wasn't in the framework at the time that, you know, we were hacked. So I, I would think it would be very remiss to ignore it now. Uh, I mean, <laughs> uh, you know, get hit by a club once and you're like, yeah, maybe yeah. I should avoid clubs. <laughs> well, and let me tell you a little bit more about what happened after that. And I'm, I'm, I'm going away. I'm going on a tangent a bit That's about fine. intelligence. So let's bookmark that. Cause I do want to go back to sure. that. But, you know, after the hack, then we ended up, we were a very small and nimble and flexible group, which is another thing that I think was part of Stratfor's success. 
we ended up having to bring more outside money in in order to you know deal with the blow that we took from from the hack and so in doing that we became more of a corporate entity so we became in my opinion more ossified in what our procedures were whereas that flexibility and that nimbleness that we had as a smaller group was really kind of i thought some part of the secret sauce of course. right yeah. um and so after i believe stratfor now is owned by a company called rain r-a-n-e i'm not familiar with that i can't really speak to that sure. But shortly after I left, or it may have even been before, but it, the timing was around the same, uh, the corporation that came in and owned the majority of Stratfor ended up pushing out a lot of people, including the, the owner and founder, George Friedman. So mm -hmm. how Stratfor operates now is, um, is a mystery to me. Well, that's fine. But, your your but, experience is good enough. <laughs> but going back to the, to the, the word intelligence, uh, it, it, I want to repeat, it wasn't intelligence in the sense that it was um, CIA type operations, although we did work with various sources on the ground and, you know, use those to, to piece together our geopolitical model. Uh, but it wasn't the way intelligence is typically interpreted. Mm -hmm. But that term, I think, was still applicable in so far as we took uh, disparate pieces of information and created intelligent blueprints based on the geopolitical model. That said, as I already mentioned, the word intelligence mm -hmm. got us in uh, a bit of trouble, or at least it particularly got me in yeah. a bit of trouble because I, the I, Chinese don't like that word. I, I, would, I, would love, I would love to continue that, and I do want to hear but at least one good yep, story okay. from you. But uh, before we get any further, I think this is really important for the audience to hear. So when you and I use the word China, we are not referring necessarily to the people of China or right. Chinese people. We're referring to the Communist Party. We're referring to Beijing in the same way someone would refer to Washington. Yeah. Um, and that <clears throat> I think there's a lot of people, with PLA in particular, I think there's a lot of people who would say that um, you, you're xenophobic if you use the word China and you're not very specific. You're talking anti-Chinese people. Of course, I can tell all my Chinese friends I am not referring to you. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> but uh, colloquialist, uh, colloquial uh, reference to China, I think, is what... What you and I are both referring to is the Communist Party for the most part, unless right. you're talking about the geographic region of China. Right. And for me, that is actually, I mean, you're 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 teaching me something new, too. I hadn't realized because when I talk about China, it is the country of China. It is the government and its operations and not the people of right. China. Right. So, yes, there's, I didn't there's even... a lot of people who will leverage that against you. I, I'm just letting you know. OK, good to know. Good to know. <laughs> they will assume that you're very uh, xenophobic. Uh, so do you think that that uh, not to get off topic, but is that uh, with the recent with the pandemic that that's become more sensitized? I think it is primarily driven by shills who are propping up the communist regime. But okay. OK, but I could be wrong. Who knows? Okay. Well, so, yes, for the audience, that is <laughs> I'm glad you Use, made that useful thing to know, yes, useful. Uh, in case, especially in your line of work. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'd love to hear a story if you've got one about the trouble that you got into when you were over there. Now, how long were you there? I was on and off in China outside of Stratfor. I started living in China. Now, I'll even back up a little bit more. My father was an Air Force attache. Mm -hmm. So we lived in Asia on and off throughout my life. China became, as I became a professional, that became my professional pursuit. So I started living in China in 1993 as a student and several times through my various degrees lived in China. And then it stra with Stratfor, I lived in China on and off for about two years. So, so how long total do you think? How long total? Probably collectively I've lived in China for about five years. Okay. All right. Yeah. So long enough yeah. to get the lay of the land and know the people. Yeah. And okay. Yeah. Great. And then outside of living there, working there, mm -hmm. you know, for over, over 20 years. Sure. Yeah. Of course. I'd love to hear at least yeah. one good story about your experiences over there that um, might indicate what the kinds of trouble you get into. Okay. Yeah. I've got a, I've got a good one. <clears throat> this was the start of it all. So um, I think it was, you know, I've been back and forth from China. I was there openly as Stratfor. Again, the moniker intelligence. Big mistake. <laughs> and uh, I one time met uh, Admiral Inman at a breakfast. We just happened to be there at the same place. And for those of you who know about Admiral Inman, he is a 
formidable figure in the intelligence community. And it was that night that around 10 o'clock at night, I got a call at my at the uh, hotel I was staying at asking me to come one floor down to a room right underneath us. What in the world is going <laughs> on? And I said, I said, no, <laughs> no, thank you. Are you sure? And Why then, not? Like, what could go wrong? <laughs> and it's then I was told this, this is not a request. So uh, that was my first experience. I feel like it was because I feel, I, I know, no, I know now that I had been watched for years. Mm -hmm. it, it was unfolded when, you know, I mean, back to when I was a student in 1990, da, da, da. You know, you did this. What was that about? And I was like, my memory is not that good, you know? <laughs> um, not to mention, in China, there is a rumor, at least, and it might have been true in the 90s, that they put formaldehyde in their beer. So there was probably a few brain cells that, like, I lost it as in, as a college student there. So they were asking me things that I was like, <laughs> I had no idea. Anyways, though, it was, I, I believe it was probably what finally triggered them into action was the fact that I actually shared space with Admiral Inman, hmm. uh, which then made it seem, oh, there's the intelligence word again, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, surely now, you know, Stratfor is truly the intelligence company that we thought it was, it was. Mm -hmm. And um, so from there on out, and this was, this was about a week before Christmas, and I was going home to spend Christmas with my son, and all I could think of during that it was about a two hour grilling, all in Chinese, mind you. Mm -hmm. And my Chinese is good. It's not that good mm -hmm. now. It was good, but to be able to talk about complex ideas was difficult. And I just kept thinking, I want to see my son mm -hmm. for Christmas. And I'll just end that story. That was the first of many similar visits. But as I was, I was left, you know, left alone that evening to go to go back to my room. And I was standing in line to leave. Again, this is a few days before Christmas. And I hear someone call out my name in the airport. And it's it's my, what I've come now to see is my handler. Mm -hmm. And she just stands, walks right up to me and like, <laughs> I almost missed my flight. <laughs> um, but I got out. And so that was, and again, more stories from there. But that was the first introduction I had face to face with the Ministry of State Security. I wish I could say I've never had any similar stories, uh, I'm sure but you in my have. travels, uh, it's been, it's been a wild, <laughs> wild ride, maybe on some other podcast, I'll get yeah. into it. But so, um, I think if we're going to start talking about, uh, the communist party in China, I think it's probably best if we start with modern day, as opposed to the long thousand year long history of yeah. China. <clears throat> and I think probably the biggest uh, change in China really started happening in the 50s and 60s with the Great Leap Forward. Um, for those who aren't super aware of what happened there, would you mind just kind of giving a brief overview of what you think kind of happened, sort of led up to that cultural rev revolution and the subsequent you know, 20 million people getting killed in yeah. aftermath or so. Yeah, I mean, the the Great Leap Forward was one of the greatest, if not, I think it might be the greatest famine of our, you know, known history. And that was the time that Mao was really, Mao Zedong, um, the founder of the Chinese Communist Party, was really trying to consolidate his power. And so he was following at that time a lot of the blueprint that he took from the Soviet Union. And so that was when they collectivized farms. Uh, they took a lot of metal, including cups and pans and whatnot, as trying to industrialize, which, as we know now, that's really not the way to industrialize. But when you're coming from an agrarian economy, you use what you have. But people, he started to create a system where there wasn't a fluid information flow. Because again, we're, we're a creating a very centralized system. And so not only that, but there was the cult of personality. And he was a very dynamic and charismatic figure. And so a lot of the numbers for farming were getting distorted when they were coming to Mao. So Mao for quite some time thought everything was fabulous. When in reality, 
it really was the beginning of a lot of chaos and a lot of death. At the same time, you know, this is when they were trying to consolidate power. So there was, you know, while this was not the time of the Cultural Revolution, this is in the process of collectivizing farms. A lot of landlords were killed or, you know, um, persecuted. And so... This is the removal of the bourgeoisie. The, bourgeoisie. the removal of the bourgeoisie. Okay. Yes. And so <clears throat> why do you think... Or, or do we have any information about why people were lying to him about how well things were going? Is there is that something culturally or is that something that they in particular were worried about him coming after them for not doing a good job? Like, what what's the sort of backstory there? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> culturally, you could look at it where, you know, in a Confucian system, which, of course, though, as part of the Cultural Revolution, you know, Mao wanted to dismantle the Confucian system, but... If you want to go back further in history, there's very much a part of Chinese um, kind of, of of culture where there is a hierarchy. And so Mao being at the top of that hierarchy, you you don't really question authority. And when you do question authority and that actually, you know, they very early on in Mao's uh, tenure, they had the the hundred flowers movement. And this was a time where. Mao invited criticism, open criticism from the academic class. And he did it in a way where it was like, you know, come tell us what we can need to do. But it was really a smokescreen to find out who might be in opposition to, to Mao's um, authority. And shortly thereafter, there was a purging of all the academics. Mm -hmm. And so... Which is a very similar thing that happened in Russia as well. Exactly. Exactly. And so there had already been kind of set in place this fear of speaking out and speaking publicly. So the anticipation of the Great Leap Forward was that it would be a Great Leap Forward. And when it wasn't, it was already kind of baked in, partly maybe because of Confucianism and you know this hierarchical structure, but also partly because they knew what could happen. And it was only a matter of time be before you were next. Mm -hmm. And that... You know, then we move up to the Cultural Revolution. So, I don't know if you want to move, get there so, yet. So, but. you know, <clears throat> just one more comment about that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Do you believe that uh, Mao was very closely watching Stalin and saying, this is my to-do list and I'm going to follow basically this set of requirements? Because it seems like it's practically the same thing, except the people were so different. It, it So it had a very... Ultimately, millions of people died, maybe as many 50 million people. It's the, who knows what the real number is. But um, Stalin did many of the same things and to, and had many of the same effects. It seems like they had a playbook that they were sharing or something. Is that <clears throat> is that right? To start with, I would say that that's that's right. Uh, Matt, one of the biggest problems, though, was very, you know, soon after Mao came into power, that you started to see fissures. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't necessarily that they were playing from a different playbook, but there was a lot of, uh, the Soviet Union came in thinking it was going to be China's big brother. And like you noted, even though some of the playbook was the same, it was very different cultures. Mm -hmm. And so there became uh, very evident fissures pretty early on between Mao and the Soviet Union when they realized, when the Soviet Union realized that China was not going to just follow along in the same footsteps. Mm -hmm. of and, the, and eventually came up with the 100-year um, doctrine where they were going to become the greatest nation in the world. Mm -hmm. And that, that, was, that originated in the 50s, I think it was 1950. Well, that, I would say, mm -hmm. even originated earlier than that. Mm -hmm. Um, you talk about Chinese culture, China itself, the word China in Chinese is Zhongguo, and the character for Zhong is center. So that's where the Middle Kingdom comes from. So the Chinese have always really seen themselves as the center of civilization. So uh, I, I would argue that that didn't, that didn't change. Well, arguably it should be Hollywood. Well, uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about the, uh, the next phase. So... Um, things are not going well for Mao. Um, now he goes, in, goes into this cultural revolution. Talk a little bit about that. Right. So the cultural revolution was a where Mao was, again, trying to centralize power. But it, the effect was a complete decentralization. 
And I'm going to, I'll go back to the Cultural Revolution, but I'll jump forward to it got so bad that they actually had to bring the PLA in because it had become so decentralized. And so it really mal mobilized what he called the Red Guards. And it was, it was mainly youth that became very, uh, that's where the cult of personality came around Mao. And so they wanted to break, they call it the four olds that included Confucianism, but anything that even was tinged with any historical relevance was literally and figuratively smashed. So any like um, remnants of the bourgeois that were not wiped out in the hundred, you know, flowers movement that was more towards academics or the landlords during the great leap forward. This was anything that was still uh, considered bourgeoisie or, you know, the running dogs of capitalism mm -hmm. was another, another term that they used. And so it really became something where it became so bad that even children to show their purity towards the cultural revolution would turn against friends and would turn against teachers and would turn against even family members. Mm -hmm. So you saw that that fervor <clears throat> and that, you know, the zeal was so strong that it really tore the fabric of society apart. It's funny. There's a lot of similarities to uh, current modern day things that are going on, even in the United States, which I think a, a lot of people are going to draw parallels. Mm -hmm. And we will later, I will talk to you because, you know, things with me have shifted and we'll get to that yeah, later. But yeah, I really that. started to take what I saw and learned in China and apply it. And that's really where I'm at now to what's happening in the we'll, United States. We'll get there. Yeah, I know we'll, we'll get, get there. We'll get but, there for sure. Yeah. Um, so skipping forward quite a bit, it's kind of interesting that um, there was this great movement coming from the children or the young, young mm -hmm. men and women who were uh, college educated to jump on board this new bandwagon to do this new thing. But then not much later, we had Tiananmen, Tiananmen Square and 400, this is something that kind of blew my mind, 400 other cities had very similar uprisings. Mm -hmm. This is not well socialized. So how did, how did that happen? How did we go from students really thinking that, you know, moving against the status quo and upending what we know to be true is being great and then suddenly not not anymore. Well, it's when Deng Xiaoping came into power, he made a lot of changes. He never outright uh, demonized Mao Zedong. That would be bad mm -hmm. as the father of the Chinese Communist Party. But he made a lot of changes that gave the impression that things were moving towards a more open society, including opening up. I mean, he was the one who opened up trade to the rest of the world. And so that gave, and this is also a lot of the kids who lost, I mean, there was a lost generation under Mao because colleges were literally under the Cultural Revolution shut down. Mm -hmm. And so there was this new kind of energy under Deng where colleges opened back up again. And there was this excitement for something new and, you know, that outreach to the outside world. But they went quicker then Deng Xiaoping was ready. So there was a, a, they, I'm trying to think of the word that I, I want to use. They miscalculated how willing Deng was to open the society. And while Deng was very interested in opening society to, and primarily opening the economy to the outside world, the Communist Party was still very much in control of China proper. And so when you saw students pushing the boundaries, that's when enough was enough. Mm -hmm. And so there was that mm -hmm. need to reassert the dominance of the, the Chinese Communist Party at that time. So let's talk about the one child policy, which I think it was around that same time frame when that started getting in, um, imp uh, implemented. I think it sort of stemmed from the fact that there was a concern about overpopulation um, mm -hmm. and there was a concern, I'm sure, that they just looked in the past and the, they're not too distant past and they saw somewhere between 10 and 50 million people die of starvation in their country alone. So 
as much as possible, let's prevent that kind of thing from happening again. What what was sort of the from your perspective and and people you talked to on the ground? How do, how do they look at that in hindsight? What what are they sort of going? Did they make a massive mistake because things have gotten unwound? Yeah, yeah. As a matter of fact, I mean they're they're already rolling that for for the past couple of years they've been rolling that back in various segments and you know um, in you know the countryside first and then in cities and whatnot. Here's the mistake that was made though. Chinese demographics is one of the um, the quickest grain demographics that we see. And this is really, really important for China's strategy that I know that we're going to talk about, this current global strategy, mm-hmm. is that they literally are dying out. And so even if with the rollbacks that they have now, I mean, you know, even if people started to have babies right now, you're still looking at a gap of 20 years at least before you can repopulate the army and that's a big thing you know and that's why we see china one of the main reasons i would argue that we see china acting so aggressively now is because their timeline to act aggressively to have people in the military who can actually um play out some of their their global goals or objectives is limited Mm -hmm. because there is this huge gap. And now Mm -hmm. the other problem too in China is particularly in the big cities, it's expensive to live. And so most people now can't even afford more than one child. And you, we, because there's the history, there's not enough parents and people to actually take care of more than one child. So they're kind of locked into this demographic demographic decline. Well, and and also it seems like the people as people get more educated, they have less children. That's yeah. Um so that's probably not helping their cause at right. all. But the other thing that's kind of interesting and I, I keep going back to this, I, I I've sort of come from a generation where there was sort of a slowdown in the amount of births in the United States kind of sort of be- between boomers and the next mm-hmm. generation, their children. Um and I always thought that was interesting because at some point I'm going to be the oldest guy in the room, at least in a in a business context, and that's times not too far in the distant future, which yeah. is kind of interesting. Um, and if that's true, then surely I'm going to get invited to more boards. And this is kind of where my head was going when I originally came up with this idea. But it also strikes me as a very similar problem in China. So you're going to have this massive amount of mostly men because of the way that people selected the children that they were going to have, um, which is a horrible, unfortunate thing. But there's a massive amount of men who are single that are very easily weaponized uh, because what else do they have going on? It's not like they have a wife to go home to. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm curious if if you think that might play into the strategy uh, that you're talking about. It's not just that there's this massive um, current amount of people that could be weaponized, but it's mostly males that could be weaponized. So in the strategy of, of global objectives, sure. is that, or, or whatever, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to lead you down a path. I'm just curious if, right. if you think there's something to that. Cause what are you, what are you going to do with, you know, half a billion men? Mm-hmm. I think that when Xi Jinping came into power, there was a lot of expectation that he was going to continue to open up society and even perhaps even democratize society. And we saw very early on that that was not the case. Um, Indeed, there were many purges as he was solidifying his own control. We've seen a drop down of that now, but and a lot, a lot of propaganda that was used mainly a lot of people see the propaganda from the outside in and think that that was propaganda directed maybe at the United States. And really a lot of it was directed internally as a mechanism of control. And we saw more control. You've seen um, aggression towards Hong Kong. You've seen aggression towards Taipei. You've seen aggression all, you know, in Chinese periphery. And I think a lot of that is to lock down some sort of impending catastrophe and to be able to mobilize internally their people. And so as far as weaponizing, you know, this 
these group of men, unmarried men. I don't, I see if them not weaponizing within their own communities external to the Communist Party, but the Communist Party more weaponizing them to keep outsiders out and to to solidify Chinese boundaries and Chinese objectives. So it sounds like we could, you know, if I was in control of China, I could build cities with these men. I could uh, create new technologies. I could, you know, investigate brand new areas of industry that might not have been possible before or right. whatever. Um, so not necessarily a weapon of war, but more of a weapon of economics. Yeah, but there you get into some trouble too. I mean, we've seen ghost cities come mm -hmm. up in, in China as just a way to keep people productive. Because there is, the one of the biggest fears of the Chinese Communist Party is its people turning against itself. Because the Chinese Communist Party is predicated on the fact that we take care of our people. And so the biggest fear of China really isn't the U.S. It really isn't Russia. It's its own people. And so that's why you still have large state-owned enterprises. That's why you still have a huge um, real estate boom. It is to keep, it's, it's not an iron rice bowl like we saw back in, you know, when it was much more centralized um, under Mao Zedong and even uh, less so, but more so than now under Deng Xiaoping. But you still have to, to have a system where the people are kept fed and active. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that, you know, is worrisome is because China, outside of being uh, an open society and free and trade and whatnot, it still economically is quite controlled because they have to have the SOEs, the state-owned enterprises. They have to have that activity to make sure that the internal dissent is kept to a minimum. Mm -hmm. I keep thinking that they should just let Hollywood have one of their cities and just say, go for it, do whatever you want, you know, because the, what else are you going to do with those cities? There's just some of those cities, honestly, the Chinese, um, their own uh, movie industry has used those cities because they are literally, I mean, there was one city and I forgot where it was, but it was built up like this gorgeous French paradise and no one moved in. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was literally, um, uh, you know, a, a, a facade. Mm -hmm. That's just a blight on the country. It really is. <clears throat> it, it will come back to, to, um, I mean, we, I've been saying that for a while and China is very adept at continue. I mean, they play the long game, of right? Course, yes. So, um, of pushing things out into the future, but it's hard to see it at a time where there isn't a reckoning with the, I was going to say irresponsible economic policies, but it really depends on the lens that you're taking because it's irresponsible from a, a you know an economic standpoint, but it's actually quite responsible for from a government standpoint in terms of again government control of a population. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about uh, Xi Jinping a little bit. So he had a pretty interesting childhood. Um, it wasn't this isn't just some career politician who just you know, his daddy was, you know, whatever, and he got elected, which mm -hmm. is kind of the nepotism that we see in the United States, yeah. or typically anyway. This was somebody who grew up in effectively poverty because his father was sort of kicked out of the Communist Party and as part of the purges, the original purges, mm -hmm. the, the cultural rev revolution, if I'm not mistaken. And he sort of grew up kind of in and out, trying to get into the Communist Party, trying to find his way in and doing everything he possibly can and got ejected multiple times, sent, ejected out of a city at one point. And I mean, he was, he was definitely on the very, very outs of society for quite a while. Um, do you think that matters? Because I, I have to think if I'm a farmer sitting there thinking about myself being ejected from cities and my family having been purged or whatever, mm -hmm. I'm going to be much more, appreciative of somebody who's lived a little bit of my life, even if his dad was a bit of aristocracy before the whole thing happened. Yeah, I, I think that one of the reasons that we thought Xi Jinping was going to come in and be different was because he did have a different background. That said, he still kind of moved up through the ranks of the, the Communist Party. So I feel that he's the economic situation, the global situation that he is facing, 
put it in perspective, even if he came from a different background and he still is part of the communist mindset that the number one priority for China is to keep its actual you know, geographic boundaries intact. And there's a reason for that. We can talk about that later, but also to keep control of the people so as not to lose power. So even though he didn't come through the normal ranks of power, power is still very much a part of the game that he's playing. And we, I was personally at least surprised with how much he re-centralized power in himself, where I thought because he came from a different background that he might actually be more open to, let's experiment here, let's experiment there. But I think that it's not, it, he was also constrained by the global world order and by the demographics that we talked about within China and realizing if they are going to play this long game and to become a power player and remain a power player into the future, that there were certain constraints that in his calculus must entail that recentralization of control. And so we saw that even much more, I'd say, than um, under, you know, Hu Jintao or previous leaders. I mean, I, I certainly wouldn't disagree with any of that. I just, I got to be thinking if I'm sitting there on the ground and I'm some some peasant and he says, I'm going to stop the purges, that's got to mean something to the population. They got to be looking at him as a bit of a, that is a massive shift. And we have a lot of globalization. Mm -hmm. we, the borders are open up for the most part. That, that's got to feel very different for the previous generation who must be looking at that as a huge windfall for them. But the, when he first came in power, there were a lot of purges. Initially. I <laughs> but mean, he did say he was going to stop them. You, you look at like Boshila, and those purges were to take people who were threats to his authority out. And he did it. And he did it really effectively. Uh, Boshila is a great example of one of the more... I mean, again, could, could this you go was, into that just for the audience? Yeah, Boshila was a... Um, he was at the time that he was purged, I believe it was between Chengdu and Chongqing where he was in power. And he really controlled a lot of the economic opening of the South. Now here's the thing. The South is kind of a powerhouse of the Chinese economy. And it was an important place to control. And Bo Xi lies. A lot of his influence was in the South. And that was a threat because the South, you know, they, they've got this saying in China, like the farther they're away, that you are from the seat of power being Beijing, you know, the more kind of freewheeling society is. And, and a lot of times these South out operating, you know, in Guangdong province and thereabouts uh, was very much operating in some ways autonomously from Beijing in the Beijing more centralized control. And so Bo Xi Lai in some ways was a, uh, his power was concentrated there and in the South, and that's where he kind of cut his teeth. And so it was very important in part to re-centralize control and centralize control over an area and a province that's known throughout history to be a bit of a renegade. And so I think there was a lot of that interplay going on. A lot of fear. A lot of fear going on with Bo Xi Lai. So mm -hmm. when you say, you know, stopping the purges, I don't really know. I don't really see that. You see a re-centralization of media you see a re-centralization of propaganda. So maybe purges in the sense of, you know, more Boshi Lai type purges, you saw a slowdown of that, you know, in the past couple of years. But I don't I think after his initial purging, he had recentral he he had, he had, he could afford to slow down on the purges. You know, he had met his objectives. We'll get back to these purges in a minute because okay. I think I think this is going to be an interesting okay. one to talk through. But before we do that, let, let's talk about this hundred year plan because I think this is kind of compelling that they, as a national strategy, have said we're going to be the best country in the world in 2050, which is coming up fast. And by some accounts, they're about 20 years ahead of their original plan, so 2030. Mm -hmm. That's something we're going to see in our lifetime, and we're we're going to be in the middle of being the second best country in the world, if we play our cards <laughs> right <laughs> at, the rate, at this rate. Um, so first of all, do you believe that's true, that they will actually achieve this superiority? Do you think those timelines are correct? And how do you feel like that's galvanizing the country? 
So when you talk about superiority, are we talking namely about economic superiority? I suspect that they feel military and economics are the cornerstone for their own survival and yeah. and being the best country. Yeah. I think militarily, and it's been a while since I've looked at this, so um, I, I can't speak with a lot of authority. Militarily, the last time I checked, there is still very far behind the United States. So that hasn't been... That's outside of cyber. I'm talking actual, you know, assets. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the U.S. Navy uh, is still very much in control of the world's waters. One of the biggest fears, though, that would allow China to have more control is the fact that the U.S. Navy now has decided that it is no longer going to patrol. You know, it's not no longer going to be the, the global police of the world. Mm -hmm. The Indian Ocean is... Yeah. Wide open and South yeah. Pacific. So we've been pulling back out of our uh, global, not, uh, you know, secure, not PACs, but global responsibilities. And there's a lot of reasons around that, too. We're no that longer we can world talk. cop. <laughs> yeah, we're no longer world cop. And, and again, there's a lot of reasons uh, why, why we're not that are, from policymakers, make stance makes sense. Uh, so that does open up a lot of opportunity for China to grow because this they were really him and, and remain hemmed in by not only the U.S. Navy, but also by U.S. allies. So that has kind of thwarted their ability to really grow. And I think the Navy is one of the biggest areas where they would need to grow in order to counter U.S. military power. Mm -hmm. Um because Navy, the, the international waters and shipping is still where we get most of our, our resources. And primarily for, the, for China, most of their energy. So that's another big thing with China is they have to import a lot of their energy. It is not something that they can generate on their own. A lot of that still comes through the Strait of Malacca. And the U.S. government or the U.S. Navy at least still controls the Strait of Malacca. And so really right now, if something dire were to happen, you cut off that very, you know, it's very narrow straight and you cut off China's energy resources. And so that goes to, I'm, I know I'm jumping out, so you might need to bring me back, but that goes to the um, Belt Initiative of getting resources overland. The Belt and Road. The Belt and Road uh, overland from uh, Central Asia. This is Russia. this is the China, the new Silk Road, effectively. The new Silk Road, yes. and one of the reasons for the new Silk Road is specifically because of the U.S.'s domination over the ocean. So they need a, a you know a, a different route, with fear that they could uh, you know lose access to energy so resources. So this this could be fuel. This could be shipping lanes. This could be anything, but it's overland. Yes, yes. overland is 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 the reason that they have crafted that um and this is 70 different countries this is involved with right uh yeah i don't i've 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 lost count mm -hmm. okay yeah but it's it's a one of the again to repeat one of the reasons for this initiative is because of u.s domination over the sea and their reliance on imported energy to fuel their economy mm -hmm. so I want to talk a little bit about mentality because I think we're starting to see a lot more, um, a sort of a gentler view of communism coming out of the United States, which I, I, I think is, is actually very strange. I think it's a, a interesting failure of understanding our history, but also maybe I'm just missing something. Uh, and I'm willing to hear anyone out who might be able to educate me on this. Obviously, there's something really comforting about the fact that we could all be treated equal and everybody gets the equal amount of whatever they need. But there's there's a fairly big problem with that, which is that a lot of people don't like working. A lot of people like power. A lot of people are going to consume more resources than they really need. And there's this network effect that is very difficult to really know what everyone's doing at all times and what they need at all times. Mm -hmm. It's very troubling to tr even think of a system that would be able to track that effectively that wouldn't be unbelievably draconian and and uh, big brotherish. So why do you think for, let's start with the China side and then we'll move to the United States. Where do you th how do you feel like China feels about capitalism? How, how do you feel like they look at us when they're like, oh, there's people who can consume as much as they want and they can they can get as high up as the president if they felt like it um, or be living in the streets. Mm -hmm. 
Well, when China opened its doors, I mean, in some respects, China is as as capitalistic or more so even than the United States. I mean, there has been it's it's really become um, kind of a a doggy dog capitalistic mentality that I feel was kind of pent up from the communist you know era where everyone had that iron rice bowl. Everyone was brought down to the same level. Um, So it's this odd mix of this capitalist mentality, but again, with a centralized approach. So China, the Communist Party kind of gets to dole out those capitalist incentives as they see fit. And they they can they pick the winners and the losers. Now you always have wonderful um, stories of you know people coming in from the countryside and starting the Alibabas and the other you know kind of I think I think so, I don't know if it was Alibaba but one of the big organizations was started by I want to say like a pig farmer. Hmm. But somebody's one of, favorite pig farmer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so but those stories I think are not common a lot of it is you know the chinese like those stories those are 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 great stories but a lot of it is driven through again still you know state-owned enterprises have a lot of control and there's a reason for that uh, because i do believe underneath chinese the chinese economic model is a lot of fragility that it it, it's kind of built on on a house of cards and so there is that need for continued or the the perceived need for continued economic control at the central level. So there's a lot of capitalists leaning in there mixed with this odd sense of centralism and the this kind of picking and choosing of who who gets to be the winners and who gets to be the losers. So what about the United States? When when college students are out there protesting having um, less less rights, literally, Mm -hmm. um, and having more state control over goods and services and means of production. Are they just absolutely, totally ignorant of the facts of how that ends up playing out? Or is there something there there? And can they point to China, who will become the most prosperous country in the next handful of years, if all goes well for them, and and say, maybe we should be doing that? So I would argue that China will become the most prosperous country that aside what really makes me sad and, about, and is that is that good or bad in your opinion that having, they will or won't that, that, that they will do you know i'm somewhat you, neutral on it mm-hmm. um i think that economic indicators are not the best measure always for for a country's strength because I don't think that Chinese economic indicators, like I said, it is kind of built on a house of cards. So the numbers to me aren't fair enough indicative of strength. Got it. So they could be militarily powerful. They could be extremely profitable, but their people are living in misery. There's people living in misery, but also, again, I feel that... As an example of an indicator that might be missing from that mm-hmm. stat. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and money is very, very concentrated, and the way it's being used is very concentrated. So I feel that the more that China uh, becomes more globalized, the more they open up themselves actually to the weaknesses in their own system. So a lot of the money, again, is being generated by these state-owned enterprises just to keep the economy going. Mm. So it's not productivity for productivity's sake. It's really productivity just to make sure that the bottom doesn't fall out. That's not the greatest economic I I fully agree. So I I interrupted my own question. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on are these people in the United States who feel vehemently that we should be living in a communist country? Are they are they on to something? Yeah. So this is where I I, I really I've started to focus my attention towards the United States when I started to see these this um, romanticization of China, romanticization of the, of communism. I mean, communism failed in the Soviet Union and in China for a reason. And one of the things that we saw, and, and even 
when I first started to go to China back in the 1990s, after Deng Xiaoping had already opened up the country, but we saw there was still this mentality of, of the iron rice bowl, that people were going to have this social safety net. And it really, there was no creativity. There was no innovation because it had been literally beaten out of people. Why even strive when A, you're going to end up being just like everyone else. So you could be the most brilliant scientist, you know, the most brilliant poet, and you're still going to live in the same, you know, 300 square foot um, cell. I don't mean as a, but, you know, very, very stark living conditions with the same um, food and resources. So there was no, outside of intrinsic incentive, there was no extrinsic incentive to be innovative because your lot in life was going to be the same. And this is why under true communist power, before China opened up and opened and brought in more free trade, I wouldn't say capitalist, but more free trade mentality, that um, you China was so low economically. Because why not? Mm -hmm. You know, why work hard when you're going to get the same thing as your neighbor? Now, I do think that in America, capitalism has... You know, that my personal opinion has gone, you know, off the rails in some ways. I mean, we saw, you know, I, I don't know how many years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, where a CEO made maybe 30 times what their employees would make, whereas a CEO now makes 300, 3,000, you know, uh, 300,000 times more than what an average employee makes. And so we do have capitalism, I think, running Muck. And so when I see people calling for more communism, I think that it's really less about, I hope, <laughs> I hope it's less about wanting to introduce communism and more about wanting to um, kind of uh, create more equality at the, bottom end. at the bottom end, where it's not the 1% that's running everything. And I think that that, I mean, I, I can get behind that. But when people start talking about communism as a model and not reforming or revisiting or reimagining, I think that's one of our new words is to reimagine, mm -hmm. you know, capitalism is it is truly an error in thinking because what you will do is dampen the innovative spirit that really did drive America you mean, to become. You mean communism, not capitalism. No, if if you bring in communism, it will dampen the innovative spirit yes. that drove America to become what America is. And so then we get back to this question of what makes a country great. So what, like I was saying with China, you might have that economic prowess. Again, I argue that it's built on a house of cards. But that innovation right now is being, there is a lot of innovation in China. But again, it's very centrally controlled. I mean, what I think when I look at America and where I still feel, have a lot of love for this country is that innovation that is that can start at a very individual level and then grow and to become something much bigger than that. Innovation in China is very much centralized. And so when we talk about bringing communist, communism specifically into the U.S., I mean, I look back at the terror of the Cultural Revolution, the terror of pointing people out. I mean, we already see not just of communism itself and of, of the devastating effects of communism on, a, on innovation in a society, in, in, in an economy, but the devastation that it has on a society where we become more the idea of individuality, not individualism, individuality really is dampened to take second seat to group dynamics, to group mentality and to group think. So I see communism as an, if we were to apply communism as an economic fallacy, but also a social fallacy that would, that is where I see America. If that were to happen, it would be interesting. It'd be because of China, we're talking, seeing it, you know, rise in its status Bringing communism into America would be, I think, the the nail in the coffin to anything that would be able to even counter a rising China. 
I think one of the more interesting policies I've seen out of China was the no more pretty boys doctrine. You have to tell me more about that. That's, yes. That's... Yes. So they they put in place something. I think this was m largely, although not completely, to to quell the K-pop uh, revolution. So um, okay. out of Korea, there was these performers wearing a lot of makeup and sort of mm -hmm. effeminate, and they were dancing. They're shaking their hips. I don't know what they were doing, but something that was directly offensive, um, primarily, I think, to the Communist Party because they're they're ultimately trying to quell anything that looks effeminate. They do not want their population to become weak, and they saw mm -hmm. that as a very weak uh, way to to present yourself. Mm -hmm. The problem is, I mean, you could just say, all right, I'm not a big fan of those hairstyles and be done with it. Uh, but they they really went further and they're like any makeup, any, you know, anyone who's dressed in this way. And you don't necessarily even know exactly what that is. I mean, there's not there's not very clearly spelled out, but they went around telling people like you're one of those people. And so you need to stop doing that. Um, but this also there's a lot of people who are not necessarily K-pop stars who dress effeminate. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of gay and lesbian people who dress in the other people's apparel or wearing certain uh, fashions or dance in ways that they, the other sex might dance or whatever on, on TV or not. This effectively provides a sort of lever for them to go after the LGBTQ community without having to really state it out loud that that's what they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, and this is the kind of weird thing within the population. You get this weird effect where everybody gets to point it and like, are you a pretty boy? Are you one of those people who's banned? And you get to look around and and start saying, I'm, I, this person shouldn't be part of society. They should be removed. Mm -hmm. what, what do you what do you think about that? That I mean, I, I admittedly that is I, I have not kept up with this pretty boy it, fun, it, phenomenon. It is crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it it is really interesting. It's not surprising to me, however. Why isn't it surprising? Why why does that sound like a rational thing for a country to say? I'm not going to allow men to wear makeup. What about newscasters who have to put a little blush on to make sure that they don't get washed out by the camera? Yeah, I. <laughs> I'm not wearing any blush right now, by the way. Just for anyone I probably should have been wearing a little this. more. But, um, I think that this, again, is the propagandizing that we've seen really highly centralized in China. There is this sense that these anything... This is called malformed that, aesthetics, if that's at all helpful. Okay. But I, I would just... And again, so I'm, I'm just... I, I, right now, I'm kind of... Um, uh, just thinking from what I know from China, since I'm not familiar with this, sure. but anything that has its own identity outside of the communist party is seen as a threat. For example, Catholicism is seen as a threat. Now threat, obviously very different than, than the pretty boys, but Catholicism, Catholicism to the extent that the Pope, that people would pledge allegiance to the Pope over and above the communist party is a threat. I can see that same dynamic or perhaps that same mindset where you've got these groups that are banding together. This happened also with the Falun Gong, right? Any we'll get group, to that in a second too. Okay, well, <laughs> any group that bands together and that might have an identity that is not centered in the Communist Party, they see as a splinter group. And then you take the LBGTQ uh, community that is very strong and that could align itself with the LBG community in the United States and other organizations or other, excuse me, countries where there is a lot of protective measures for that community. And that creates a, a backlash that would be an immediate threat or a direct threat in the mind of the Communist Party to their authority. I mean, it seems a little odd that the people who are protesting in the United States in, in favor of communism are talking about, a, and in favor of China in particular, are talking about a country who, if they were there, they would not be allowed to be who they were at all, uh, especially now. So it, yeah. it seems a little counterproductive if that's your end goal is to, you know, be an individual and am, am I yeah. way off base there? Yeah, no? yeah no, I mean, I would, I would, uh, yeah, I mean, yes, 
I would absolutely agree. And that's uh, that's some of the cognitive dissonance that I see with people wanting to. I mean, I see this. I feel like in the United States, this idea of equality and equity, which are not the same thing, by the way, but that's a conversation for a different podcast. <laughs> but that idea of, of equity is being conflated with communism. And so there, the nuance of the United States having all of this diversity and all these different groups that are have all these different movements, it would not fly at all all in china hmm. so there's this again there's cognitive dissonance. there's this conflation that communism would mean that we're all equal or equitable and yet it would mean that we're all the same so for example to give the example of the pretty boys no more pretty boys because you can't be the same you know we wear we're going back to to literally for i'm afraid that people aren't aware of history but if you go back and look at china during the communist um, revolution Everyone not only were wearing the same gray, green suits and carrying the same red books, they even had the same haircuts. There's like four haircuts they're allowed to have or something. I mean, I, and, <laughs> and, and, and that's, not, that's not an exaggeration. That is right. a truth. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, I think that there is a... And even the same shoes, I think, right? Made of tires or something, mm -hmm. right? Am I wrong about mm -hmm. that? No, yeah. no. And so there is, again, I think there is a conflation and a confusion between what equity means and what it looks like when it is particularly when it is state sponsored well at least you don't have to worry about what to wear in the morning just go in your closet put on your tire shoes and you're <laughs> off to the races so let's talk about the uyghurs um okay. which i know is uh it's oddly this has gotten a little bit of press i'm kind of surprised i figured this would be one of those low rumbles that everybody in the press would be happy to ignore um because they want to make sure the beijing olympics go off without a hitch um but the Uyghurs have gotten a little bit of publicity, just a tiny bit, just a wee bit. Um, I've seen it in maybe four or five different publications now, which is a lot more than I expected to ever see it. Mm -hmm. Why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, the Muslim community there and how they're seen? Because this really fits perfectly into this. Uh, we'll get into Falun Gong in a minute, but mm -hmm. uh, into the pretty boys and anybody who's sort of outside the, the normal. The norm. Yeah. There's a couple of things about the Uyghurs that, um, you know, first, like we would discuss, I mean, they're, they're, they're not Han, the Han majority. Uh, they, you know, worship, they have a religious system that is above the state, you know, also not acceptable. Um, but there's something that's really much more interesting that makes the Uyghurs a object of tyranny, if you will, from the state. Xinjiang province, where most of the Uyghurs live, is a buffer. It's a buffer from the stands out there. And it is, when we go back to the Belt and Road Initiative, it is critical for the Belt and Road Initiative. Not only that, to the extent that China has any of its own resources, a lot of them are concentrated there. A lot of the pipelines that they're talking about run through there. So the fact that the Uyghurs have their own culture have their own perception of how they should be governed, that is the threat. Because Xinjiang is so critically important to China's overall global strategy. So it is a buffer, and that is why more so, I would say, than the fact that they're Muslim, or the fact that they think differently, or you know worship um, a, a, a god that might have more authority than the Communist Party, that's what makes them the biggest threat. So there's about 10 million Uyghurs, I believe, mm -hmm. and about 1.6-ish current estimates are currently in concentration camps. And as many as maybe 25,000 of them have organs um, that are harvested per year. So how does a country that's that powerful and that able to manipulate that many of the population, how, can, how come they can't just simply move them? out of that region or take some less, much less drastic move, like, like extradite them, just move them outside the country, just push them out of the borders. I mean, a lot of countries do that kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I guess that's, a, that's a possibility. It, it, Is it simply the news, the publicity of the wave would be too many? It's 10 million people suddenly crossing the border. Yeah. It's probably a cost benefit analysis. I mean, literally how, let me tell you, 
when it comes to push comes to shove, the Chinese government doesn't really care about what we think about them. I would imagine so. It's more important about how they're perceived internally. So the fact that we're, you know, screaming about the um, tragedies happening among the Uyghurs, that doesn't phase them because, again, their primary objective is to remain a, a intact geographically, demographically, economically. And so while they want to, of course, there is some sense where, where they can, you know, they'll they want to put on a good face. You know, so that they can continue to have that global push that that is is part of their hundred year plan, like we said, but that's not their number one priority. And so, I guess I would I would say most likely, and I don't know for sure that they probably did a cost benefit analysis. What would literally cost the most money? Would it be putting them in concentration camps, or would it be moving them out? And then, if it's moving them out. How do we fill in that space? Because Xinjiang is so incredibly important. There is absolutely no way that the Chinese would let Xinjiang become its own province. Hmm. No way. And they have been ass assimilating um, Xinjiang. There has been, much like Tibet, a huge um, movement, migration of Han into these areas precisely because of the, of the importance of the geographical importance of Xinjiang. So I don't know why... Uh, they chose the tactics that they're doing now, <clears throat> excuse me, over and above mass migration. But I'm assuming that it just, it worked easier. And I don't think that they cared too much about whether or not, you know, what the international outcry was. But perhaps putting people in tran uh, concentration camps is less so than mass migration. I'm not quite sure. Let's talk a little bit about Hong Kong. Um, so v very briefly, just so everyone's familiar with the backstory, because I'm not sure everyone understands what Hong Kong, its brief history um, as its independent entity was. But can you briefly talk about the British and how that all happened, just so we're on the same page and then we'll jump into what... Yeah, yeah. I mean, so Hong Kong, when was it? Was it 1997? That it, I mean, it was a territory for... Uh, my, my, my numbers are rusty. You know, a hundred years. It was a part of the, you know the Opium War. They they allowed the British to say Hong Kong was a British territory. You know, the time came up. I want to say it was 1997, and I might be my my dates might be wrong. Um, and so the promise was to keep Hong Kong as an autonomous. It was the um, two governments, one state policy, or something along that that way. And the reason that that worked for a while was because Hong Kong was a place that some Beijing leveraged. I mean, it was, it was a port. It was active. I mean, they, they themselves put a lot of money and a lot of flow international trade through Hong Kong. So that worked for a while, but the fact that, you know, Hong Kong started to, again, much like the Falun Gong, much like the pretty boys started to assert its own autonomy. That's when, you know, that wasn't, they would rather have control over Hong Kong than have it be the economic port or the economic powerhouse that it was. That is more important in the overall government strategy is to keep that unified China whole. And so. So the government basically walked into Hong Kong when they were finally given the keys. And pretty much the very first thing they did is start doing a purge back to these purges. Mm -hmm. uh, they found the, the group of people who were any amount of resisting of whatever policies they wanted to put in place, which were, you know, severe, uh, mm -hmm. not not necessarily, you know, death camp severe, but certainly by someone's uh, freedom loving view of the world, uh, living under effectively European law for quite a while, suddenly is going to be pretty shocked, I think, by that new set of standards. If I was sitting in Taipei right now and looking at what's happening in Hong Kong, I think I would be very, very concerned because that was this tiny little place where mm -hmm. of medium strategic importance, I would say. But Taipei, on the other hand, is enormous strategic importance. What do you what do you think about that? So this goes into what we were talking about earlier about demographics and about the military. China sees an opportunity now that it may not have in 20 years. Couple that with the fact that the United States, I mean, there is a question, would the United States uh, support 
type A in, in the sense if, if, you know, push comes to shove. Do you think they would? I'm sad to say that I, I, I I'm sad to say that I'm not sure. You know, I would love to be able to say absolutely, but I, 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 I don't know that they would. I, I, if I was to take a bet today, I'd say unlikely. Yeah. But Outs- I, I, I don't know. I might be wrong too, but it does. I have not heard enough bluster from the United States about the operations that have been running inside Taipei. And I have mm-hmm. friends who live there, so it's not. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I haven't either. And I, I, to the extent that they would do anything in a scenario where China were, um, were to come in and, and aggressively take over Taipei, I think that the most that they would do was make, would make a lot of noise and or provide more military and, um, you know, ammo literally, um, to the, to the Taiwanese themselves for their own self-determination. So this is effectively, if I was Xi Jinping and I was looking at this, this is the culmination of the end of a hundred year long civil war. And if he is able to take these two entities and turn them back into one to, mm-hmm. you know, the broken egg and turn it back into a single one, mm-hmm. that seems like something that would solidify him amongst his people forever. That, and you'll see, we've seen more aggression in the South China Sea um, for several reasons. Again, the U.S. Navy is not as present as it used to be, but also because they know if that string of pearls, that is which uh, most of the areas that surround Japan, the Philippines, even now Vietnam, um, those are all Vietnam more new, newly, but all part of the American, you know, um, sphere of influence. And so they have started to come into the South China Sea more aggressively because in the future, when they don't have the military, because of the demographic crisis, they won't be able to be as aggressive. So it's now or never. And so they have started a much more aggressive. It's slow moving by taking little islands that you know are disputed from the Philippines, little or islands. Building their own islands. Bi- Actually, I mean, these some of these island chains aren't even really islands. I mean, they are part of the year they're under underwater, mm-hmm. building those up specifically. So they are moving down. So they with the objective of not being hemmed in, because if they wait too much longer, they will not have the military clout to be able to do so. Add to that that they see an opportunity with America right now. And this goes to another, you know, uh, there, there's there's so many moving parts here. But this is another reason why it is so useful for both China and Russia to mess in our internal politics. Because when we're looking inside and we're pointing fingers at each other, we're not paying attention to the last island that was just, you know, built. This, we're is, not- this is definitely one of my biggest beefs. When I, I was in the airport a couple of weeks ago um, during the Christmas break and I was looking on TV and I wasn't really paying attention to it. It's just more like, what is, what's the news? So I'm looking at it and it was something about um, some actor who died three weeks earlier and his spouse is now talking about him. Uh, oh, it was, uh, it was a comedian. I'm spacing out his name, right? Uh, and then, and then it was two kids that were found that were missing or something. I'm like, what is going on? Like, why are we like Ukraine? What about uh, what's right. going on in China? And like, like there's some very serious world affairs happening right now in in that moment, and I was acutely aware of. And as long as I watched the TV, I seriously didn't see a single thing of note. And if that's the case, if we're if we're if we've so missed the boat on what's going on geopolitically, then I think you're absolutely right. I think it's this is a wonderful opportunity for uh, a number of our competitive uh, nations who don't necessarily have to be competitive. They could, they could be partners mm-hmm. um, to take advantage of that situation if they so choose. I, I, I think that's absolutely the case. I think that China looks now in on our country and sees all the divisions with, I mean, with a beer in their hand, mm-hmm. you know, and just, I mean, this is, the, they are, and, and because of that, and the other thing, men, you know, factors I mentioned, I think that we will continue to see more aggressive pushing of boundaries, which would, it, Taipei is very likely to be within that strategy. In case you were wondering, it was Bob Saget. That was the name I oh, couldn't Saget. come up with. Oh yeah, I just heard about him. <laughs>
So I have an interesting story about Taipei. Um, I was invited there many years ago. I had just come up with a new exploit and uh, was invited over, which is a, a somewhat typical thing to happen in our industry in computer security. And uh, it was a brand new issue, so it was uh, it was pretty pretty no noteworthy. Uh, and it later became a much bigger deal. I show up and I'm basically asked by the head of this group to to speak. So he's sort of showing me around and. You know, they're putting me at the head of the head of the tables. So, you know, the, all, all the things you'd expect. And uh, it was, I found it was a wonderful experience. Had no problems up to that point. And I'm about to get on stage and it's an opera house. And he points back behind in the back of the opera house. And there's all these, uh, these uh, barriers sort of set up, sort of designed to push people forward. So it looked more full than it actually was, which mm -hmm. I'm not offended by. If there's a hundred people in the audience, I'm probably happy. Uh, but there was, you know, whatever, maybe 500 people there or something. So it was a relatively good crowd. And he walks up um, and says uh, a couple things to me. He's like, first of all, um, do you, uh, are you okay if anybody records you? I'm like, I, I prefer not because there's, there's uh, some stuff in the slides that I just don't really want out there yet. It's, mm -hmm. this is brand new research. There's this one particular slide I just don't really want out there. Uh, I don't mind if you guys all see it. I just don't want it publicized out to the world. And he's like, no problem. So a few minutes later, I, I'm about to go on stage now. I'm like ready. I'm getting everything plugged in everything. And he says, uh, so remember that whole recording you thing? At the back of the stage, uh, back uh, in that uh, area back there, there's some guys with cameras. Do you see them? And I look back. I'm sure enough, there's some people back there with cameras. He's like, that's the Communist Party. That's the Chinese. That's the PLA. Um, something of that effect. And I'm like, why don't you just kick them out? I mean, it's your country. He's like, mm -hmm. mm -mm, I can't do that. I'm sorry. And so I went on stage and I'd give my presentation. There was one slide I really didn't want recorded. So I did my best to kind of click, click as fast as I could on the slides. Uh, fast forwarding in the story, uh, I went home and, and there was one particular URL that they'd have to hit that it was on a server and I checked it and it was hit from all over the world. That was definitely widely viewed, that mm -hmm. particular, that one particular slide. So later on, I was hanging out with this person, and he is sort of the the son of their head of their CIA. Uh, so he's very highly placed, and um, he runs a anti malware company. And effectively, they were trying to solicit me to come work for them. Um, and he didn't he didn't mince around. He he told me exactly what it was. He wants me to build weaponized malware for him and in, in the country. And so during this conversation he was talking about china as an enemy to taipei and how we have a mutual enemy and he's trying to get on my good graces which mm -hmm. is, you know, this is this is good recruitment you know good trade craft <laughs> and so i effectively just kept asking questions like okay so tell me what's going on he said one of the things that you don't understand is this isn't just a matter of you know computer security there's this other stuff going on for instance um like sars v1 at this time mm -hmm. um that was introduced, we, we have strong evidence that that was introduced into Taipei to test us to see how our pandemic response worked. I'm like, that's terrifying. Uh, I didn't, he's, and it didn't occur to me that he would be so highly placed that he would get this sort of incredibly confidential information. Of course, he's the son of the head of the CIA, so, or their CIA. So then the second part of the conversation, and this is, this is what gets into my world, he said, um, we have it on good authority that the Chinese have approximately three pieces of sensitive information, like PII, on every single man, woman, and child inside of Taipei. And the reason we know that is because we broke into the system. It's called Million Grades of Sand. We broke into it and we stole it. Now we've got a copy of it. Um, and now they're able to do the same sort of reconnaissance on themselves and within China. This, so this system is not just focused on them. It's mm -hmm. focused on everyone in the world. Um, and I have no doubt that we have copies of it in our data centers as well here in the United States. And if it's that easy to get, especially it's, as we're allies with Taipei, um, or at least sections of it. So when I was hearing this story, I had to think, well, if I was China, that's exactly what I would do. I would build up the biggest set of databases on every single person at, I would go through every single birth record that's publicly accessible. I would find every social media account and I would just log it all. I mean, obviously the NSA is going to do the same and anybody with the sufficiently large um, intelligence agencies are going to start working in that, that direction. I'm kind of curious how you see um, the technical sophistication of China. Do you see them going further down the path of 
sort of stealing as much information as they possibly can on people as well as what we're hearing more and more is uh, technical uh, information being stolen from various different uh, companies around the world, uh, specifically private intellectual property that is maybe not turned into patents yet being stolen and brought into China. It seems like that's part of their doctrine. It's not It's not a, a sort of dot, 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 oh, we also do this, but this is sort of part and parcel to how they operate. Absolutely. I, I, there, I mean, it's just like a one word answer. I mean, absolutely. I don't, that, that has, that has been the, um, MO and I don't see why that would, I mean, there's nothing, there's no incentive to, to change. I mean, they've done it effectively. Uh, you know, there's also this sense of, uh, you know, imitation in China is considered a good thing. So there's not that also sense, like when we used to work in China, and we would help companies come in to start up in China or given, you know, the, the information, the groundwork, whatever. I mean, one of the biggest things that we had were IP infringements. And even if you had a legally binding contract, it didn't matter. So that, I mean, first of all, legally binding. Which you, court? You're, yeah, you're going to, yeah, even if yeah. you had it in the court, of, of you know in the United States, yeah, but get them here and <laughs> exactly. Um, but there was also there also is also this a sense that uh, imitation is the highest form of flattery too. So there's not that same sense of of theft at the very like kind of cultural roots. But absolutely, I, I see no reason why. And in the again within the primary objective of keeping China intact, all things are like that, that's, that's not a concern. So the other very large publicly known hack was OPM and the Office of Personnel Management, which is effectively this large uh, top secret database that is the sort of the back, background information of all of the intelligence operations, people, everybody who has clearance mm -hmm. in the United States. Mm -hmm. Why this is a single piece of th equipment that is on the public internet is kind of beyond me, but there you go. <laughs> uh, we live and we learn. So one of the most terrifying things about that story actually <laughs> was uh, not the fact that now they know all this information about all these people that could easily be used to blackmail them and do all kinds of crazy things. But I have it on good authority that afterwards we found it again on Chinese servers. So before it wasn't really clear if it was China who did it mm -hmm. and we're still not a hundred percent, a hundred percent sure that it's them, but it's them. And we know that it's them because we found it on their servers because mm -hmm. we broke into their servers. It's sort of this game we play. Um, but because it's such sensitive information, we had to go over there and show them how to secure the information because we didn't want other com countries to have this information. I mean, that that's the kind of thing that really st stresses me out a little bit because yeah. that, that puts us both behind in two completely different dimensions when stuff like that happens. And so when, you, when people say, are we going to lose this war? I have to think that there's a lot we're doing wrong and a lot that they're doing right. And they can, do a hundred things wrong and they don't care. It's not like it's the communist party is not going to say, well, mea culpa, they're going to just keep going and do the, keep doing the next thing. And it, it doesn't really matter if they have a couple of operational misses. I think we have a lot more to lose because we're a much smaller country in many ways. Mm -hmm. What is your question in that? Well, I'm, 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 I'm not sure I'm, I'm tracking with you on that last bit. Well, I think it speaks to, if, if there is sort of an operational dominance in the cyberspace, mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think that we, if we do have it, we're not really showing our hand. And yeah. China has unfortunately, unwittingly been sloppy about their, their procedures and how they protect the data that they do have. Mm -hmm. But the data they have is enormous. Yeah. It's enormous. And they have so many more people to be able to collect, to be able to not only, you know, collect from an intelligence standpoint, but going back to, you know, social media and the way we are manipulated. I mean, they have people on payroll. Yes, I'm sure we do too, but I mean, there's just so many more people. 
Uh, and so there is a disadvantage there. This is another reason, though, why I really worry about the internal dialogue in the United States that is uh, leaning towards communism as a model where I feel that there is, I worry that there will not be enough in a, incentive to innovate uh, and that and that will put us at a disadvantage as well. So, so yeah, I, I, I mean, I want to believe that the United States has is not showing their hand. Mm, I would like to. Believe I want to believe that. <laughs> um, but like you said, we've seen, and you know, I've seen too many hacks. Mm -hmm. And but here's the thing, though, Robert, if if the same was happening in China, we wouldn't know about it. Because there is no way in hell they would let you know that they got hacked. So, again, I'd like to think that the U.S. It could has be this, information asymmetry. We really yes, don't know. We we truly do not know. Who do we talk to? We got to find that person. Put them on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck with yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, I like to talk a little bit about the Great Firewall of China, mm -hmm. um, which is got to be an enormous pain having it lived there. Um, trying to just communicate mm. and do simple things on the yeah. internet. Um, yeah. Many things are blocked. And for those of you who don't know what it is, uh, it is effectively a censorship system. It's a bunch of routers. Um, last I heard, they were Cisco routers, of all things, um, that effectively allow the country to monitor connections and figure out certain types of connections that they don't want to allow. And they send reset packets in both directions, shut down the connection, and you can't reach it anymore. So... Mm -hmm. The original research around getting around it was something like, well, just ignore the reset packets on both sides and now you can communicate. It'll keep sending reset packets, but who cares? But one thing that I thought was interesting is there's another way to get the firewall to get angry at you. And that way was it does sort of deep packet inspection. So when you make a connection and you use the word Falun or Falun Gong mm -hmm. um, amongst a bunch of other litany of words that we were able to figure out, um, it basically blocks you for five minutes and you can't connect to that site at all for five minutes. Mm -hmm. So before I go any further with this story, um, can you tell us what Falun and Falun Gong, what, what that is? Yeah. I mean, Falun Gong is, it's, I would, I don't know. It's not a religion per se. It's really more of a meditative group, uh, artistic like tai chi. group. Yeah. Like a Tai Chi, but for reasons that I'm, I can't really speak to they generated quite a following. And again, it was this sense that the leader of the Falun Gong, and his name uh, escapes me, was such a figure that people would follow him over and above the dictates of the Communist Party. And again, like we were talking about before, that is, that's unacceptable. And so they would do, you know, when they really got cracked, the crackdown came was when they were able to assemble a bunch of people in uh, Tiananmen Square for, again, it was a meditation. It wasn't a protest. This was not a, you know, redo of Tiananmen Square, but the fact that they were able to amass that many people and that the leadership had that much control was ultimately a threat. I do not know if there was anything more to it than that simple assessment, whether or not the Falun Gong, everything that I've heard, the people that I've spoken with who are followers of Falun Gong, it really is not, to them, it's really nothing more mm -hmm. than a meditative and lifestyle, um, way to lifestyle, organize your life in a more spiritually uplifting way, you know? So again, like you said, Tai Chi, maybe even yoga, mm -hmm. but- Which does have cultural, deep cultural roots. And right. There is a religious aspect to it, right. some spirituality associated with it, and that might have been partially the driving force for seeing it as a threat. Mm -hmm. But other than that, if there was more to it, if there was some you know, kind of insidious um, plant within the Falun Gong that was you know, a, 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 a foreign <laughs> agent, I don't, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. It was simply that power that was, again, it didn't fall within the hierarchy that the uh, that was comfortable for the Chinese Communist Party. So part of the security research I did was how to leverage the Great Firewall against itself. So 
if you could effectively cause machines within China or outside of China to make arbitrary HTTP connections mm -hmm. just blindly throughout the internet as fast as they possibly could, looking for Falun to every single IP on the internet, effectively the entire country would shut itself down. Um, which is a kind of a fun little hack. And you, actually the code fits in a tweet. It's, a, it's actually a very, very small <laughs> piece of code. Uh, I gave that presentation many years ago now and um, coming out of it, like one of the people stopped me and he's like, are you worried that you're going to get killed? And it wasn't one of those like, are, are, is that you know, it's this sort of a fringe thing? Like, are you, you really think that? It was more like, I think you're going to die. Like right. you, you really need to stop doing what you're doing because that is really dangerous research you're doing which is the first time I've ever really had that sort of chilling effect related to the research I was doing. And, and I've done some pretty intense research and I North Korean research and so on, mm -hmm. uh, stuff that was used in the green revolution. But um, that in particular really kind of blew my mind. But later on, several things happened. Number one, people started using HTTPS pretty much everywhere. So the, the utility of them keeping that filter on for any length of time, if it, they ever saw it acting up, goes to zero. I mean, mm -hmm. they're not going to be breaking the bulk of the internet. Uh, Google Chrome started using HTTPS everywhere, and so it effectively made it very, very difficult for uh, for that to be a useful, viable tactic. So what we're sort of left with is Sesame Credit. So Sesame Credit is the next generation firewall, but instead of it being a technical control at a network level, mm -hmm. it is designed to get people to um, obey the regime um, and very similar to our credit score and our ability to pay back mm -hmm. our, our debts and, you know, basically uh, make sure that we, uh, we're a credit worthy. Mm -hmm. This is the sort of credit worthiness or the so how much uh, how reliable are you for the regime? Um, how closely do you follow the rules of the regime? So yes. there are some examples where somebody, if you buy baby food and dishwashers, you get a higher credit score. If you buy comic books and play video games, lower credit score. Um, but that's that's sort of the, I would say already that's terrible, but it gets worse. Mm -hmm. So the first level it gets worse is now they're going to tie it to uh, who you're friends with. So let's say yep. you and I are friends and we're having this conversation. Let's say you were living in China and you had n no other negative affiliation with China, never said a negative word about it, but you and I are friends and I have said something negative mm -hmm. about it. Now you, because you're implicated with me, get a lower credit score mm -hmm. and people around you are going to get a lower credit score because they're friends with you and so on and so yep. on. So this is a network effect and you can see this is all open data. This is not closed. So you can go see who everyone, where everyone is on this graph. So that immediately makes people want to chill and remove themselves or go over and beat that person up until they, you know, get back in line. Mm -hmm. So that's one level of terrible. And, and by the way, the ramifications of that for anyone who doesn't know about this are you can't leave the country. You don't get jobs. You can't use public transportation. Oh, you yeah. can't you can't get a loan. Yeah. You can't buy a house. A bunch of really terrible sanctions yeah. on you, um, basically making it so that you die in mm -hmm. an alley somewhere mm -hmm. all alone. So no one wants that. That would be bad. Uh, be bad. So, that, <laughs> so they're going to comply. So that's that's sort of the first level ring of bad, I would say. Yeah. But much bigger and a much wider ring. Uh, actually, a brief aside. So uh, I was looking at the Canadian government website around their uh, view of Sesame Credit, the Chinese Social Credit Score, and they said, well, it's going to have implications for. Uh, for Canadian business and and certainly all businesses elsewhere who do business in China. Um, and their reason for it was the flexibility of the government to change, arbitrarily change law. Mm -hmm. So they can go in and say, well, this type of business, you know, being in the pretty boy business, you know, selling makeup for men, where you're just carved out of society. You get a negative credit score if you're involved. And so you can very quickly remove entire lines of business out of China just by fiat by saying this one type of thing is not allowed anymore. So I thought that was very smart of them to put something out like that so it was a little bit more obvious, um, but it didn't go anywhere near far enough, not even close. So the real problem is China now has the ability to uh, finger point anybody outside of China. So they can have a, an effect, let's say I'm a CEO living in the United States, minding my own business, but I do some work in China. 
now I can have somebody within China saying, no, I can't work with you anymore because of this thing. So Canadians guidance, and this was kind of terrifying, is you should work with people inside China who understand the local laws and can tell you what you can and cannot do. So clearly that's going to be part of the PLA or, mm -hmm. you know, some government agency within within the Communist Party. That means effectively China has now gotten in control of any company that does business in China. How does that strike you? Yeah, I, I, again, absolutely not surprised. Um, this the you called it the sesame that sesame was, credit sesame credit that yes. was a new word for me. But I, I absolutely understood every the, the social credit that they have started to implement. Um, that there have been incidents that have not been publicized that we've had to look into. And this again was years ago where um, local authorities would literally blockade a visiting CEO into their um, office space when they came to visit and not let them out until certain demands were met. So I, I absolutely, I, I see that that is the next trend. Of mm -hmm. course it is. So this has been ongoing for a while. Now it's showing up in this new way with through the credit uh, score or credit system. But again, I think that it will really depend on the value that that company, that foreign company, foreign CEO has to the Chinese government. And if the value is great enough, then they will watch them, but they will override anything that might show up negative. If you are just your average, say, button maker looking for a factory in China, and you've got something negative on you or, or you, you know, you're, you've spoken poorly of China in the future. Oh yeah. I mean, you're, you're out. Mm -hmm. So it really, it, it will depend on the value of the organization to the Chinese Communist Party. Now here's something we haven't talked about and it's tangential to what you're saying, but it's a trend that I've been noticing and it's not a new trend, but it's one that you don't hear about that much. And this goes to the, the discussion of China's economic heft is a lot of country, a lot of, excuse me, corporations are starting to realize the, that the benefit to working in China is not as great as the cost. And we have seen um, l large organizations moving more to, particularly we're talking like in the automobile industry and whatnot, moving more to Mexico. And so I think you are seeing, it's not a mass exodus, but you are seeing an exodus. And China is going to need to weigh at some point, I believe, where they draw the line, particularly when they, China's economy is still largely predicated on exports. So that, I mean, that is going to be of great importance. Either they are going to have to fill in those exports, you know, from domestic organization companies, but then they don't have the investment. But again, I don't know that that matters to them because they'll just invest in themselves with the SOEs. So I know that that was a bit of a, of a tangent, <laughs> but that's, I don't think that that, I, that is a trend that doesn't surprise me. I think they will continue to, to move along. Some of the areas where I would see that trend or the government not paying as much attention is particularly in the areas where they can get technology that they need and a lot of that's in the medical um, spaces. So it's not necessarily the high-tech technology maybe that, well, it is high-tech technology, but not something maybe that would be a, sensitive to a, a country, but that's a lot of the areas where I've seen a, a lot of continued and robust interplay is in um, medical fields mm. because that's a, a priority to the Chinese government. It, it should be. Uh, they've had very poor health care for quite a while um, for a wide variety of reasons. So one other trend that I thought was kind of interesting was the the Communist Party seems to want to have a stranglehold on the security industry, my little chunk of mm -hmm. the world. Mm -hmm. And they've actually gone to the point, there was a new vulnerability um, late last year, 
uh, called log4j that affected a lot of companies. This is not like a little issue. Mm -hmm. This is tons and tons and tons of com companies that are affected by it. It's a little thing within Java. So uh, apparently it was invented by somebody at Alibaba and mm -hmm. they got a <clears throat> very large slap on the wrist from the Communist Party for releasing that to the public internet instead of releasing it just to them. To them. Just to them. Can you explain a little bit more or... Maybe I'm interrupting you because I'm Go not ahead. quite sure. Go ahead. J no, just this development. I'm unfamiliar with it. Uh, well, effectively, um, somebody within Alibaba came mm -hmm. up with a new exploit, which is a very common thing okay. within companies. A lot of, you know, I'm working on something and then you kind of go down a rabbit hole, you find a vulnerability. Okay. In this particular case, they just released it to the public internet. They put it out there so everybody could have equal access to it. Got it. And of course, it's it's a very easy to use exploit and it got weaponized and now it's being used all over the internet. And I'm sure a lot against people inside China as well. Mm -hmm. So it's not mm -hmm. just, you know, outside of China. Everybody, China included, got it, uh, got affected by it. So instead of just saying, well, that, that was great research, uh, thank you for doing it, or that's dangerous research, but you should come work for us. They actually went fully and slapped uh, them on, basically sanctioned Alibaba because of it. So I think this is another example of where that centralized authority actually gives them an enormous amount of control. There has been some, there was a, there was a um, Senate hearing about China today, as a matter of fact, and they were talking largely about how, um, there has been a number of hacking contests. One of one is just in China, and there's another one that's globally. And the one that was in China, they found something like 37, I believe, I might get the number slightly wrong, um, vulnerabilities, good, you know, payable type vulnerabilities, what mm -hmm. they were after. The global one found something like 20. So just within China, they've dramatically increased their capabilities. Now, none of those those vulnerabilities they found made it to the public internet. They're all owned by China now, by the by the Chinese government. So I think this is that the centralized control thing is very interesting and it does provide very strategic advantages in certain cases, that being one of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I also think another version of that would be the various different chat software that we're seeing coming out of China. Um, mm -hmm. Zoom, uh, for instance, TikTok, et cetera, mm -hmm. WeChat. These are things that are... Um, they give an enormous amount of control and visibility into the public sphere. Um, I believe it was Grindr that was recently bought by uh, a Chinese organization as well. So now they're getting fetishes. Now they're getting long tail history of the backstory of a lot of children uh, mm -hmm. who use TikTok. It's largely for mm -hmm. kids who are, I'm sure, using it for other purposes as well. Not Absolutely. So... How do we combat that? How do we get in front of the population and say, these are just not apps that are doing what you think they're doing. These, these, are, these are largely meant to steal your data. I mean, I, are we listening? I think that we've been saying these things. I mean, even, even when it's not an external threat like China, I mean, we've, there has been, you know, you, Zuckerberg Berg is, you know, always in Congress talking about all the flaws within Facebook and talking about the algorithms. I mean, the attention economy is rich. Oh, I'm not at all claiming that we are yeah. any better. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and, and I also think, and this goes back to something that we were saying, we are so concerned with our internal div divisions that we really, I don't know what it will take for us to realize the amount of power that we are giving externally to foreign players through the apps that we use. I actually, you know, after my experience that I told you about and many others in China, I at this point assume that anything that I, you know, that nothing, everything. I mean, I think Alexa listens in to me on, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah, I'm she, like, does. I'm not, <laughs> she does, I mean, she actually does. But, um, you know, and it's not a paranoia. It's, it's, it's become in some ways, um, it's your friendly listening device. That yeah, just happens to you be. know, <laughs> and, and there's not that sense, I think. And even, even with me, like I said, cause I'm kind of like, well, I know you, I know you're, you're listening, you know? So, um, I try to be discreet and when, when, when needed, but I don't think that our younger generations 
really recognize the threat in the same way that I don't think they really recognize the inherent flaws in communism. Mm -hmm. And so, and as we're so focused and we have been so captured by our attention economy, part of which is, as you mentioned, owned, not within the United States. I mean, those things just don't even, don't even make it to the level of importance. Mm -hmm. So these are the things that worry me. And I don't know outside of prioritizing this sort of information in our media outlets, which has not been the priority, you know, particularly over the last five years, how we, how we make that impact. Well, I don't think Alexa will be a particularly upset with you, but I do, I get upset. My friends always think that I'm spying on them. So um, <laughs> very rarely, by the way, do I do that only special occasions. Um, so, um, I think another example of this is companies like Huawei. Um, Huawei, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, how did, did I pronounce it wrong? Just slightly. Did. Oh, okay. Yeah, All right. Yeah. I'll I'll do my best. <laughs> so it's funny. I, I was talking with a Gartner analyst. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with them. They're an analyst mm -hmm. company. They they uh, tell you which products are good or bad or whatever. So I was at this conference and I was saying, well, I think that they're going to have a hard time of it. I think people in another two or three years, you'll still be hearing uh, issues about national security in Huawei. And, and he's like, no, they, they'll be fine. No one will, no one will care. It'll be completely fine. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure. And he was adamant. And I'm like, I'll bet you a dollar. And uh, exactly, I think it was three years, exactly three years to the day. That was the day that the United States banned them outright. And now they're definitely front page news. Apparently they believe they've lost something like $13 billion by not being able to sell us handsets. Um, mm -hmm. uh, because they also sell handsets as well as firewalls and routers and switches. But that's the kind of company that it's very easy to buy the low cost phone. It's very easy to buy the low cost firewall or switch or whatever. Um, I don't think your boss is going to get particularly upset as long as you're the one managing it. Right. But we really don't know what's on any of these devices. We really don't have any guarantee. And, and what we do know is there have been devices that have been tampered with and brought mm -hmm. to the United States. Mm-hmm. The software uh, bill of materials is not included. Um, we really don't know what's in them. And what, what are your thoughts on that? Sh should we have these banned lists? Or like, is that effective even? I mean, there's, so, I, isn't it? Um, it's a banned entity list if yeah. you want to look it up. <laughs> but there's so many organizations like even um, Symantec. Am I saying that right? The Symantec. Yeah. I mean, aren't they partially owned by? There's a lot of companies that are partially owned. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, you can ban Huawei, but Huawei probably partially owns. And I don't know. I'm, I, I, but there's so many ways that there are vulnerabilities in the system. I just don't think that you're going to be able to account for them all. I mean, it was a, a nice, you know, PR splash to ban Huawei. And, you know, it, you know, made a lot of people pissed off in China. But Huawei is just the tip of the iceberg. Sure is. You know? And there are so many other organizations that are operating in a similar way. So I think that that really, it's not that it's, it's moot. I just think that it, it, it was really a, a, it was a PR stunt. So another example along those same lines are VPN companies. So there's an enormous amount of VPN companies out there that are, often try to advertise on conservative radio stations I've found, which is really interesting. interesting. Yes. Uh, and the corporate structure is very hard to parse. Um, mm -hmm. They do a lot to try to protect themselves, mm -hmm. but you can trace them if you're careful enough. You can get back to the fact that they're owned by Chinese entities. So why would China want to read the internet traffic of the conservatives in the United States? Um, and then furthermore, how do we get out to the general public that this just isn't safe? You think you, you can never hide information from your VPN provider. So you have to be absolutely certain that they are doing the right thing. And how can we be certain if we don't have some sort of transparency about who owns what on the Internet? Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. That's I that that's new news to me. So I'm just, again, kind of you know spitballing here. I think that that plays into 
the strategy though to create fear internally within the US so that you know if they're targeting conservatives i would say you know it's like you know, they're watching you but not us you know not us being the chinese it's like you need to be careful of your information from your own you know countrymen women whatever and so I, that's a pretty slick strategy to make people more fearful and again it goes back to i mean again I, I, i'm guessing this is new information to me but it goes back to the sense that a fearful nation is a nation that is more pliable when this information did come out it was interesting to see the comments when people were talking about it and one of the the naysayers was like well why would having it in the united states or anywhere else be any better mm -hmm. and I actually had a, kind of a hard time answering that question because it's it's a valid question. Why would he trust the United States over China, over Russia, over any other country? Because maybe it's exactly the United States who he disagrees with their policies because this person might be protesting on the street looking for communism. And so all I could really answer without without trying to interject any you know feelings about the matter mm -hmm. is you have to pick whichever side you have the the least amount of concerns with getting in complete control of you and your data. Or the side that is the most easily manipulable because they're not looking at, I mean, yes, the, the conservative party might be the one that's fighting more against communism, but to the extent that this generates fear internally and does so pretty well, again, it, it, they're not so much concerned. China doesn't care whether or not we choose communism or not they care whether or not we come after them if we you know thwart their their um expansion etc they they really don't otherwise care so putting us in disarray is a is, is an objective mm -hmm. whether or not we become communists or not like that's not that yeah. doesn't matter so if they made the strategic um analysis that targeting the fears of conservatives was a easy, you know, tool to generate that, you know, further division, then, I mean, it, whether or not conservatives were concerned about communism, I don't think played into their, their thought matrix. Yeah, I, I kind of doubt it too. I think it was more about being able to see what those people are doing um, mm. and you lever eventually leveraging it for uh, operations. I see. Okay, I'm hearing you. So that they could actually be reading what the the, huh? Okay. Yeah, I was seeing it from a different perspective where it was a more of a fear tactic versus trying to see what the conservatives were doing. Yeah, I don't know that I have an answer. Because why do answer people use that. VPNs? I mean, yeah. sometimes it's to watch their favorite you know game in another country where right. they couldn't get it. Yeah. A lot of times it's something else. Yeah. See, the only time I even think about VPNs personally is when I'm in China, trying to get to my Gmail. <laughs> <laughs> and wouldn't it be great if they own the VPN that you're connecting right. through? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So this leads me to quantum computing. Uh, this okay, is, you might take me out of my realm. It's, here, it's, but... it's all right. It's all okay. right. But I, I really just want your take on it. So quantum computing has been described by Xi Jinping as a super weapon. And so this isn't this isn't somebody who's unfamiliar with the technology. And mm -hmm. and for those who don't know, he had a mechanical engineering background. So he's a pretty technical guy. I mean, mm -hmm. this is not somebody who has no experience with any technology. A lot of our a lot of our unfortunately our political sphere has zero understanding of anything that goes on in the world. This is a this is a technical person. Mm -hmm. And so I'm sure he understands there's something called Shor's algorithm that would effectively allow a quantum computer to um, break cl classical encryption. The effect of that means that things that rely on encryption, uh, on encryption to to work, things like cryptocurrencies, things like you connecting to your bank, uh, things like you and your cell phone trying to connect to your home entertainment system, all those things over over SSL TLS, and mm -hmm. all of them would suddenly be visible and decryptable by the Chinese government if they had access to this thing. So it is a super weapon. He is not overstating it. it okay. It would absolutely cause, if it, if it was available to him in whatever way he wanted to use it, every single piece of sensitive information that the government sent over public internet uh, that wasn't behind a skiff or behind a firewall mm -hmm. would suddenly be accessible. And even that stuff largely would be accessible because of spies and you know people who break into things. 
So this is definitely one of the most groundbreaking pieces of technology that doesn't yet exist, or at least we don't think it exists. Mm -hmm. But the people I know who spend a lot of time thinking about this think that it's a year or two away, which is way faster than the public media is saying. They're saying more like five to seven years. If that were a weapon in his arsenal, the opportunities are effectively boundless. I mean, it's really just a failure of imagination to say he couldn't do X. Of course mm -hmm. he could. He could do whatever. Mm -hmm. And really the only things that would still be secure are things that use one-time pads where you don't have either access to either pads or uh, stuff that, like I said, that they just don't see. If they don't see the traffic, they can't intercept it. So where... Where does that leave us? I mean, where where do we go when nothing we do is our own? It's all easily tampered with and seen by our adversary. Well, I mean, I ask you a question because again, this is you know, I'm, I'm familiar with the the idea, but not really you know, and with any any depth. Is this something that the United States is working on too, or is, is oh the, yes, absolutely. Okay, well, that's what I thought. So, is there but the China expectation? Has, China has definitely a lead in this area. They they do. They've okay. invested very heavily in this, and artificial intelligence and a number of right. areas that are right. sort of similar asymmetric warfare type things. Mm -hmm. So, cybersecurity being another one. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me like if this were to happen, we really don't have anywhere to hide. Like all of our secrets are now out there. And what is a society without its secrets? Yeah. I, I would like to actually have you answer that question. Like, what do you think the United States would be if we had nothing that was private anymore? Do we even have a civil society? Is the United States even capable of running? I mean, secrets in the sense of, you know, going back to like intelligence and CIA. But I mean, that sense of privacy, just even at the individual level, no, I, 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 I think that that's absolutely an individual right that if it is taken away, you have, will have some sort of mass chaos. I mean, is that, that's not me saying that, you know, government should, shouldn't be transparent and whatnot. But there is there is a sense that for security reasons, you absolutely have to have some sort of privacy. I'm even thinking now about all the um, individual activity around like blockchain and crypto and whatnot. And if what I just heard you say, I mean, if that's all. Easily tampered with. Easily yes. tampered with. Yes. You will have like a mass revolt, but that'll be. That won't, that'll be a global, that won't just be the United States. That'll so, be a global So the, the people I know talking response. about this feel like it is not necessarily going to be an on or off switch. It's not, they're not going to decrypt all traffic everywhere all the time mm -hmm. and utilize it uniformly perfectly all the time. They will pick and choose, mm -hmm. which means that it'll be very hard to know when it's being used and things will just go in their favor mm -hmm. whenever they feel like it. Mm -hmm. um, That's really frightening. I concur. Yeah. I, I mean, I ask you, I mean, what do you, what do you think? Honestly, I mean, is this a, this is my podcast. What are you talking about? No, <laughs> I want to know. <laughs> I mean, but seriously, is, 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 are we doing enough? I definitely don't not. I don't think we're doing enough. No. Um, I don't even think we're doing the bare minimum. Really? Um, no, but that's what this podcast is about is raising awareness and yeah. maybe we can get there. And, uh, there's some people in town that I might be able to get on the podcast at some point, um, talk about quantum computing and AI and some of these other areas that are being heavily invested by China. But I do think that we're in not so great shape. And if we don't do something very, very quickly in the next year or so, we're, we're going to feel it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I, you know, I don't want to overplay this, this analogy, but I really do feel that, this is another reason why we, among the fact that, you know, we're susceptible to, to division because there are things that are divisive within internal to our, our, our country and, and our national dialogue. But I do think a lot of it is, it is open us up to manipulation. And mm -hmm. I think that that is, that's one of the key strategies is that manipulation so that we aren't, you know, and 
not only are we not paying attention to it as individuals, but as governments, we're just trying to put out fires, you know, little fires here and there versus some of the bigger fires that we should be paying attention to. And I can only hope that the that that our um that our government is having these conversations. They're just not making it to the to the mainstream. Let's hope. Yeah. So one of my more conservative friends um, has a idea, which I'd love to get your take on. One of the pressure points that the United States has not leveraged is the Chinese uh, students that are here. We could very easily select, you know, basically put them all on a registry, which already sounds terrible. Um, but this is his plan, not my plan. Mm -hmm. uh, take like the first 100 or whatever and say, you must say disavow china we're going to give you a script or you can write your own or whatever we're going to videotape it we're going to put it on this thing or leave and do this specifically for anyone who's whose children is part of the communist party um, mm -hmm. not just any random person mm -hmm. um and very quickly we would find and his, this is his opinion we would find that one of two things would happen either they would say see ya and they'd all leave because they just don't want to do that or they would say okay yeah i do want to stay and that puts them in some pretty hot water but it also allows us to start applying pressure because now we can see that the bulk of the chinese um communist party's um goal of the people who actually work in it is to have their children go abroad and learn and mm -hmm. be part of the society or whatever if they get expelled from the united states and possibly other countries as well following a similar doctrine it would be very difficult for them to stand up and say, yeah, I'm part of this party. They would say, no, 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 we got to start playing ball. Not necessarily leave the party, mm -hmm. but we can't have our children not able to work in the United States. What, what do you think of that? I mean, I realize that's just about the craziest thing I've ever heard, but... Um, less and less are Chinese coming to the United States to study. And this is even pre-pandemic for several reasons. I mean, Chinese institutions have become competitive with American institutions. A lot of times when Chinese students would come to the United States, it was almost because it was easier for them to get in to American institutions. I mean, I would say 20, 30 years ago, people were coming here because of the superior academic opportunities. That's less so the case now. So why are they coming here? They're actually they're not. I mean, and this is something that they, they've it, the slowdown. It's slowed down quite a bit. Mm. It has slowed down quite a bit for a variety of reasons. Our school system just isn't as competitive as you know, Tsinghua or um, you know, Beijing University, and 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 um, and also there was a crackdown on a lot of the outflow of money coming to the United States. So a lot of times people use school as a way to um, channel money out and there's limits on how much money you can take out. So there's several things that were going on. Then, you know, Chinese uh, American economy wasn't all, you know, they were, they were generating a lot of the tech, like you already noted internal. So a lot of times if they even had people coming to the United States, there was the expectation that they would come back and build the tech. So I, what makes me, I don't like that policy for several reasons. First of all, it assumes that anyone coming over here is coming over for nefarious purposes. And of course there are some, but then we, we create a stigma against all Chinese students. And then we've already seen what happened in the pandemic. Communist Party in particular. So their family would yeah, have but, to have some tie to it. That that was okay. that was specifically called out. Specifically called out. Yeah, okay. I, I okay. checked on that one. <laughs> okay, okay. Like how yeah, racist is this? <laughs> yeah. But even then though, how do you know? I mean, if they start to what if it what if they hide the fact that they're with the Chinese party? So I mean, then you become mm -hmm. suspicious of anyone who is just Chinese. And then you lose this. I mean, I think the great diversity and 
culture that we the Chinese culture that I think is is very important in, in the right. United I States. I agree completely. But it is an interesting thought experiment. It like is. what would happen if that were because we're not in control of policy. Right. Some people in Washington are. So if this right. suddenly became policy, mm -hmm. I think it'd be a very interesting as in may you live in interesting times type interesting sort of policy. Yeah. I and again, I just I don't I I don't see that flow of students to the United States, first of all, has 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 yep. trickled. So there's that. So it wouldn't be that effective of a policy because there's not all that many. Um, I see if it were something where they said, okay, you just can't be part of the, the Communist Party. Um, this is like contracts in China. Okay, I disavow the Communist Party. You know, write it on paper. But, you mm -hmm. know, that, that doesn't mean you've disavowed the Communist Party. A lot of people who came earlier that I'm familiar with who were part of the Chinese Communist Party, their objective was to to take this information and to go back to China and start businesses and whatnot. So what do you, you're going to say if you're part of the Communist Party, even if you're not a spy, you can't go back to your country to start a business with the degree that you took from Harvard. I mean, I just don't see that being that that's that that's a McCarthyism. Mm hmm. That's too much of a slippery slope. I mean, yeah, I wasn't a particularly huge fan of yeah, it myself. <laughs> I, I'm trying to think of other things that might might work, but again, no need to come up with it here. Yeah, I just wanted to get your brain working on it. I mean, we've got enough witch hunts going on. Uh, <laughs> they, it, like, well, we don't need help. <laughs> so, I think what I'm starting to narrow in on when I'm thinking about specifically China and Russia is what I'm calling now Cold War II, um, mm -hmm. which I really wish I hadn't come up with something so catchy. Um, <laughs> there is some uh, TV show called, or uh, something called Cold War II. <laughs> I did not come up with it. I'm not the first person to ever say it, but uh, I think in this context, um, it really makes a lot of sense. We're right back in the Cold War all over mm -hmm. again, and hopefully it stays cold and and um, the, the body, the casualty count stays low, but still. Um. One of the Chinese doctrines is called Xi, um, which is the, um, I don't know much about it, so maybe you can educate me, but it's effectively the idea that you have to get your incentives aligned. Because one thing they found, I guess, probably right after World War II, is their alignment with Russia was not particularly great. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe that ended up working in their favor by virtue of aligning themselves with us. Uh, they ended up becoming an mm -hmm. economic superpower and... Russia more or less broken fragments and is hardly a thing. You know, saying that right before they invade Ukraine or whatever, but <laughs> uh, do you think that that is the right way to think about it? Do you think that they're thinking about strategic incentives and alignment as one of their primary doctrines? Is that is that what they're after? Strategic incentives and alignment in terms of their hundred year plan and sure. yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I always see the Chinese as very forward looking, playing the long game. That's part of the strategy. Uh, I think their incentive is to be the, the middle uh, kingdom, if you will, how that plays out though, the, is, their maps are all backwards. I've seen. <laughs> that's that's what's curious to me, because again, they, if China, if it was not for the Bretton Woods system, which we now have seen is the, I mean, we're, we're that that's that's gone by the wayside. China wouldn't be the economic powerhouse that it is. It is because I mean they were a closed backwater agrarian society. It was only when they were able to have free access, thanks again to the, you know, U.S. Navy, that they were able to access the world's markets. Um, and so as part of this strategy, I don't know if it's part of the incentives and I don't, I don't, I'm not sure if I fully understand your question. So if, if I, if you need to re-ask it, mm -hmm. but as part of this strategy um, to grow for the next hundred years, they have got to, really be able to continue 
to access the rest of the world. They cannot close off again. And so that's where you see this strategy of the Belt and Road that we already talked about. This is where this opportunity right now of the U.S. moving out gives them more freedom of navigation. Um, and yet at the same time, even despite the, the challenges in U.S.-China relations and in Cold War II, I think that there is still a synergy is not the right word. There's alignment. <laughs> there is an alignment that we need our goods. We need our very cheap. We need our goods. They need access to um, to their energy resources that are primarily still coming across the water. Again, the Belt and Road is one of their initiatives and one of their strategies where they can. Uh, it's kind of funny. We used to refer to China as in the, the, the dishware as as something that's the fine China that yeah. is uh, very expensive. And now I think we are more dependent and find more value in the product, despite the fact that it is much cheaper. Mm -hmm. We are very reliant. Basically, I look around the room and effectively every single thing in this room was made in China or Indonesia or right. one of those similar countries. Although, again, that is not with more the like, you know, cheap consumer goods, but more like the automobiles and some of the the larger textile or companies as well are starting to move out of that. And so a lot of though, though, the international trade fuels as well as printing money. That's another thing that the, the Chinese do, though, fuels the the drive to generate the economy, to generate all this kind of tech exploration and whatnot. And so there's still a reliance on the United States that I think that while they're taking advantage of the United States pulling back from the international scene, I think that they would not, China's strategy would not be so bold as to completely overturn um, that relationship and that dynamic. Gary Kasparov, the, the famous chess player, um, said that, um, I'm paraphrasing poorly, but he said something like, if you're playing chess against, uh, Russia, they're very belligerent. They're going to mm -hmm. go right for your queen. They're going to, they're going to try to take you out immediately. Mm -hmm. China is the very long, you work around the edges right. and just death by a thousand cuts and finally get there. The United States can't pick one. We have to do both. We have to know both strategies and be playing both games at the same time. Mm -hmm. sort of a 3d chess um i think that that puts us in a pretty pre precarious position especially in a cold war ii environment where yeah. we have two very strong superpowers it's not like the first time around this is a mm -hmm. much this is a much more aggressive on both fronts uh and much more powerful on both fronts i, I think in mul multiple different ways despite the fact that russia has now broken up in some ways they're more powerful the way they are now um I'm sort of, I'm sort of curious how you see the future of the United States and our, and how we're sort of dealing with them, and ultimately how you see the parallels between how communism sort of grew up inside China and and what's happening right right now, where authoritarianism seems to be rising within the United States. It's yeah. like we're all sort of becoming mirrors of one another in a very strange way. Yeah, yeah, and I I do think that. If the trends within the United States of the rise of authoritarianism, we will not be able to really counter not just China or Russia, but the co combination of the two, both of which would be very happy if these, you know, um, if, the, if you, the United States continues to fight internally. But you're absolutely right. There's two completely different strategies. The only saving grace if things were to go completely off the rails or not the only i'd say there's two things that come to mind if things were to go, go completely off the rails i do think that the united states is um, still in a power position militarily and before the quantum computers come and they can shut everything down if things were to get so bad that it necessitated some sort of a aggressive you know front I think that there's still an advantage there. Obviously, that aggressive front, they couldn't 
play let's, it. Let's on, not play out the war scenario. Let's. <laughs> but well, but let me say this. I but I don't think that here's here's peace and love. Let's let's. I talk like about, peace and love. <laughs> Russia and China don't get along either. That's true. And so it's this really weird. Um, relationship where you've got Russia coming at America for its own reasons, it's not dissimilar from China, where it's like, if you're not, if you're looking inside, you're not looking over here, right? Mm-hmm. Look over here. Don't look there. Same, same reasons that China interacts within American politics, right? But China and Russia don't like each other either. So I know I went to, to the, to the war scenario, um, <laughs> Get me back on track. So well, what, I, I what, like to talk you... more about the authoritarianism within the United States and how how do we get in front of this problem? I, so this dovetails a little bit into what you're doing now, and mm-hmm. I kind of like to talk about that mm-hmm. as well. So when you're well, well, first of all, why don't you tell us what you're doing now, and then we can d- get back into the authoritarianism <laughs> okay, and how okay. that's all related? Because I think okay. I think what you're doing now is actually a very important thing for right. combating it, and it starts with conversations and. So why don't, you, why don't you tell us what you're doing now? Yeah, I, I, so with everything that we talked about, with, with my information on China and where I saw China um, become so centralized and become so authoritarian, you know, I saw these trends starting to to surface in the United States and some of what we've already touched on as well as like these um, affection towards communism and other systems that tend towards, you know, authoritarian rule and and so i started to apply everything that i knew and everything that scared me from what i knew about china and put that lens focus that lens here on the united states and so i'm doing several things along those lines and you know i started my own podcast mm-hmm. hold my drink podcast that's a very good podcast yes thank yes. you yes um despite the drunkenness <laughs> There's really no drawing, you know, just a drink here and there, just greasing the wheels. Um, but, you know, started because we've become so polarized that we don't even, it we, and there's many reasons for that outside of China, like I said, in Russia. I mean, I think we are being exploited by China and Russia, but the polarization is for reasons that are a lot of, lot internal, um, including the way we use or misuse social media including the way traditional media has become more um, uh, polarized as well in the sense that, you know, media in the past, you would have most media tended towards the center because you'd have the big advertisers. And now we've gone to a, 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 um, a what's the word, a, a model where I'm, I'm having a noun failure here, um, subscription model, right? So then advertisers create niches. And so then you have more polarization within actual art mainstream media. So you've got, you know, kind of the Fox news and the MSNBC. And so advertisers that used to kind of control in a way, the, the messages, mm-hmm. uh, and the messages therefore had to be more neutral. Now you've got the more conservative advertisers with, you know, you've got outlets for them so they can, kind of still have the same spread but within these and some various of them niches. are chinese communists so <laughs> and some of them maybe maybe chinese communists. um and then you've got political sectarianism as well so you've got these things that are pulling us us, us apart internally for our own reasons but i see that developing authoritarian trends and us identifying the other as evil that I see that is a replay of what the cultural revolution looked like. And I feel like while that is being exploited, the biggest fear I have is us tearing us apart from the inside out. And so in some ways, all the threats of China, Russia are moot because we will uh, yeah, absolutely. We w- we will have destroyed ourselves from the inside out. I mean, who is it that said that? Um, was it was it Lincoln who made the quote about you know the biggest the biggest threat is 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 internal. Well, if my podcast and your podcast are any indication, at least we're a couple of groups of people who are perfectly willing to have open conversations with whomever. Yeah. It really doesn't matter your political beliefs. I'm I'm willing to hear you out. Well, and I think 
and I worry, I was talking about this earlier today. I worry, I think that there is a tribe. I don't really like to talk about tribes because the tribes are what kind of have gotten us in trouble in the first place is our tribalism. But there is a tribe of misfits, if you will, or dissidents, if you will, who are saying like, this is enough. This is enough. Like if we've got, if we can't even learn how to talk amongst ourselves and we're even seeing this breakdown within our families, much in the way, again, I- Sounds awfully reminiscent of- previous cultural revolutions, doesn't it? Exactly. <laughs> and so you've got a lot of intellects who are talking about this, and I see this more and more, but I fear that I've put myself in this tribe of dissidents. So I'm always shocked when like someone was telling me a story um, actually coming out of, of England of something that was very disturbing that was shutting down any kind of questioning or opposition in a very authoritarian manner. And I was like, damn it. Because I, you know, I get comfortable in my bubble of dissidence. And I think that we're making headway. And I do, I do think I am optimistic. Oh, I do that's good. I do think we're making headway. Oh, good. But I'm not so sure. But uh I'd love to hear some some optimism. <laughs> yeah. I think we can turn it around, but I don't think we have. I, I, and I don't think it's actually turning itself around. I think we're gonna have to do some hard work. I, Both of us and many other people, similar. I do. I, I agree. I agree. We're not there yet. We're not at an inflection We're point. We're still on the skid. We're still on the skid. But there's enough people who are starting to, to have this conversation, I think, that I, yeah, I, I. That's just not oversteer, right? And we gotta, we gotta find the middle ground. So tell me about the Moral Courage Project. Mm. Was, I really, okay. I just love the name. I think it's uh, <laughs> it's a good name. I, it really is a good it's name. It's a good name. Yeah. So Moral Courage, the way it was originally defined by Robert Kennedy, was it tre speaking truth to power, right? We've kind of taken that idea because speaking truth to power, that sounds lovely. I like to think that we're, you know, doing that now, but it's whose power power is always seen outside as like it's power of the system, you know, tech titans, media moguls, the protesters, the police is always the power that's outside of ourselves. And it's really what we are suggesting is truly countercultural. It's speaking truth to the power of our own, of ourselves and of our own ego. And we feel like that's what's been missing in our dialogues with each other. And that's what's been one of the reasons that we have created this polarization in the first place is that we live in the society. I already mentioned before, you've got the social media, you've got the political spe uh, sectarianism, but our egos haven't really been fully formed. So our ego was there meant to save us when, you know, a saber tooth tiger was coming our way. You know, it's the fight, flight or freeze effect it didn't evolve to really take in account the current, you know, Twitter sphere that we're in where a few words, it sees that as a threat much in the way you see a tiger mm -hmm. and a saber tooth tiger. <clears throat> so we have now assumed mere discomfort actually is a physical threat. And so again, that primitive part of our brain, the ego hasn't evolved to address modern society. And that is one of the ways that we think that there is this polarization. And so it's a, an attempt in applying moral courage is to hear and not fear different viewpoints. So one of our big premises of moral courage, moral courage college and the moral courage project is really to teach viewpoint is, is diversity without division. And so much of diversity itself is one of the areas where we see us coming apart and us fraying the, the talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, how it's applied in schools, how it's applied in colleges, how it's applied in, in um, corporations. And what we've seen is there's been more division as a result. And so we're taking that model because we do believe this is one of the things that I think, and this is me talking personally, that makes America so great is its diversity is that's why I was cautioning against 
you know, your friend's conservative view of like, what, what should we do with Chinese students coming in? I love that idea of diversity because we've got so many different ways to think about the world, world and to solve problems where, you know, if you're looking at more homogeneous countries like China, you know, there are, and the way the, the Chinese education system that I do think lacks innovation. And a lot of the innovation comes from taking innovation from other countries and then using that, you know, perhaps even better than the original countries. And so I love this idea of diversity, but I fear the way we talk about it today is driving in many ways a lot of the division. And so this idea is moral courage is diversity without division. And where it adds to traditional diversity initiatives is it goes beyond demographic diversity to viewpoint diversity. And so it's like what we're talking about here is this kind of tribeless tribe of dissidents who are willing to question and to hear again, I you know, repeat here, but not fear and have these hard conversations that we need to be having if we are to, to survive these external th threats, if they are to arise that, that you and I are discussing here specifically with actors like the, the communist party of China. And I want to go back though and reiterate what we started at the very beginning when we're talking about china we aren't talking about the chinese people we're talking yeah. about government objectives for you know world domination or you know global <clears throat> supremacy every country has their checkered past and us definitely included we all do so. yeah so and we've been we have been the united states have, has been doing a lot of navel gazing lately some of it for good reason. I mean, some of it, some people would argue that we have not addressed our checkered past appropriately and that we need to revisit it. I'm not arguing that at all. But the problem is we have been locked into that conversation at the expense of real crises, external crises that need us to be able to talk across our differences. And so that's what moral courage is about. Moral courage is about trying to have those conversations and making that the norm of viewpoint diversity in all of our discussions. Where do people find you online? What's, what's the best way to get in contact with you or listen to your podcast? So the podcast is hold my drink podcast, and you can find that all platforms, Apple platform, uh, you know, Spotify, et cetera, YouTube, holdmydrinkpodcast.com all you can access all that from there moral courage please don't hack it yep yeah. oh my god oh. <laughs> don't say that now you just <laughs> i'm calling you all right all yeah right. i'm calling you <laughs> uh, <laughs> more to learn more about moral courage is moralcourage.com or moralcourage.org we've got a nonprofit or arm of that as well and um yeah i think those are all the places you know that That's we're great that I'm operating in. Those are the most important circles, at least. Well, I really want to thank you for indulging me in this very complicated, very perilous conversation. This is uh, this is quite an endeavor, and I think we did it. So now you've got to come and talk to me with a drink. All right. <laughs> and I then I get to ask the questions to you. I don't know what that sounds. Uh, <laughs> we'll we'll talk about it. <laughs> no, it sounds great. I'd love to. Awesome. All right. <laughs> Well, thank you for joining us. Uh, you've been talking with myself, Robert Hansen, and Jennifer Richmond. Thank you so much for having for coming on the show. Thank you, Robert. <laughs>